You're live, mister. You're live. You're live, dudes. Now, it's going to be 16 seconds before they see us. But, guys, we are live. So, glory to the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It's good to have you for part two. People are excited. We're going to have people upset and angry, but that's okay. Because, as I said, and I want to repeat to everyone, I did say we're going to bring on Kai. He said maybe February, maybe March. And he's going to give the Eastern Orthodox perspective. For you who are angry, be patient. I try to be fair and balanced and let everyone have a say in the matter. They're going to make a thorough case for what they believe the early Christology actually <clears throat> was. And they're going to quote sources. So then by when he comes, he already knows the material and he can respond. Be patient, my brothers and sisters. Be patient. And for the record, because I want to correct this misinformation before we begin. Someone said that before I brought these brothers on, I thought Oriental Orthodox were heretics. I never thought that. I just want to be clear. I'm on record. You can watch my previous sessions. I've never said Oriental Orthodox are heretics. I've actually said they are Christians, and their church is ancient, and it's apostolic, and they belong to the body of Christ. I've never said Oriental Orthodox are <clears throat> heretics because I don't believe that. Now, you guys can anathematize one another. I'm not part of that group. Let me make my position clear. God doesn't care for my opinion. I pray the Lord has mercy on me. If I'm wrong, may the Lord have mercy on me. Because my desire is to honor Jesus and try to bring true unity, not at the expense of truth. I acknowledge the Oriental Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox, Roman Catholic, Assyrian Church. I acknowledge them as ancient churches started by the apostles that belong to Christ, but one of them has more of the fullness of the truth than the others. I'm on a journey to see which one, but this is my position. Now you've heard me say it for the umpteenth time. Do not misrepresent me. If you don't like the fact that I say Oriental Orthodox are true Christians, take it up with the Lord. May God have mercy on you and me, but do not say that before I brought these brothers on, oh, they brainwashed me. Oh, they're deceiving fam. See, before that, he thought that. No, I never thought that. So I just want to make the record clear. And again, we invoke the Holy Spirit, the eternal spirit of the Father and the Son. Bless these brothers. Fill them with the Holy Spirit. Anoint their mouths to speak clearly without error, to recall the facts accurately. And may the Holy Spirit give us control to at least hear them out, even if we disagree. And may the Holy Spirit have his way with us and bring us into the fullness of the truth and empower us to know the truth and live out the truth to love the truth, the Father is the truth, the Son is the truth, and the Holy Spirit is the truth. May you be glorified in our midst, Father, Son, and Spirit, in Jesus' name. Oh, and the final thing. Here you have Church of the East, the Syrian Church of the East, who is in friendly dialogue with the Syrian Orthodox Church and the Coptics. See, they're all speaking in love. You don't see them bashing each other. So that's another lie. Well, the Coptics, they uh, hate the Assyrian. Well, okay, well, you have several Coptics. Syrian Orthodox with Syrian Church East. And for the record, that name, Zaya, for those of you who don't know, one of the saints for the Jidus. I'm Jidu. I'm from the tribe of Jidu. And the Assyrians, we have many tribes. I'm tribe of Jidu. Marzaya happens to be one of our saints. Marzaya Tawana and his disciple, Martaur. Just wanted you to know that. Now, brethren, it's time for you to shine. I'm here to moderate. I may ask questions for clarification, but I'm learning. And I want to make it clear you did shock me last time when you said St. Cyril was a Miaphysite. Some people thought I was acting. Oh, you see, he's an actor. No, I was shocked, generally shocked. I never knew this. So, Lord bless you. Let's proceed. Thank you, Sam. Again, we're, we're very thankful uh, to you for, for letting us on a second time, especially. Uh, and I don't know, I don't know how, like, how many times we're going to need, uh, but we'll see. Um, so... Uh, Today, I want us to start, uh, we'll, we'll recap real quick for next time, I mean from last time, of saying uh, us and the Church of the East are in agreement that Cyril was a Miaphysite, and Ephesus condemns Diophysitism. Uh, us and the Church of the East are in agreement on that. Now, now we're, we're, we, we're also in agreement on the definitions of the terms. And who can speak on this is the Assyrian Church of the East and the Syriac Orthodox Church, because we are the in, the only 
inheritors of the Syriac, ancient Syriac Christianity until today is just us two. There is no other church who even claims to be, whether it's Eastern Orthodox, Roman Catholic. It's only us. We're the last two left, Syriac Orthodox, Assyrian Church of the East. So we tell you what our words mean in our language with our definitions. You don't tell us. We tell you. So the Assyrian Church of the East and the Syriac Orthodox Church agree on the terms. We agree on what the words mean. All right. I have a, I have the list in front of me. So real quick, I'm just going to do a rundown and we'll get into that. Uh, and uh, Shama Shazaya is, is on with me. I'm a, he's a subdeacon in the Assyrian Church of the East. I'm a subdeacon in the Syrian Orthodox Church. Okay. Uh, so we're both uh, subdeacons and the two Syriac churches divided by the Roman Persian border. Emphasize now, the fact you're sub. You're sub. Okay. <laughs> it's an inside joke between me and him. <laughs> so uh, parsopa, which comes from the Greek prosopon, gnoma, which is usually uh, the Syriac version of the word hypostasis, Kiana, which we have to mean being a tutha entity, usia, which is the Greek usia. So now um, examples of these we can find in the Syriac Bible in multiple places. Let's say uh, Hebrews 1.3, you see the, the exact image of his being in the English here would be a tutha in the Syriac. Um, now, uh, Shamash Azeh and I, we've talked about this extensively for hours, and in each case we are coming to um, the conclusion that we mean the same thing in the words. And it's not just my opinion or his opinion. This is the historical opinion of the dialogue between the churches. Um, you cannot have... A lot of them mean the same thing isolated. But in context, they are always used consistently in particular contexts. So you cannot have... Uh, Knoma and Kiana are things that always belong to each other. There's not a kiana that exists without Knome and vice versa. Okay? So I think, Shamashadeya, if you, if you read the quote last time, or uh, maybe you didn't, I can't remember, the quote from your patriarch in the time of Isaac of Nineveh, uh, who the Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholics also venerate. Uh, Shamashadeya, do you have a quote handy of your patriarch in the time of uh, Isaac of Nineveh where he says, no one's ever heard yeah. of, of uh, Kiane, multiple Kiane existing in a single Knoma. That's, we don't accept this language. In, in so let me repeat language. the question. Yeah. Your mic is clear, but it's cutting off. Let me repeat what he's asking. The patriarch of the Assyrian Church at the time, what is his name? Ishoyao the second. Say, sorry again. Ishu. Ishoyao the second. Ishoyao the second. So the patriarch of the Assyrian Church said, we've never heard that of a someone who has multiple kiane, the word kiana means nature, multiple natures, but one knuma, knuma, one knuma. So understand what the question is. If someone has more than one kiana, one nature, because I got to explain to the people, these are technical terms. So I'm going to try to make it easy for all of us because I'm learning too. If you have more than one kiana nature, you have to have more than one knuma. Knuma and kiana go together. If you have a kiana, you have a knuma. Exactly. So if you have two kianes, you have to have tre, two knumas. See, this is the dilemma. You can't have one knuma, which is hypo, uh, hypostasis or hypostases. You can't have one if you have two kiana, two natures. If you have two natures, you have to have two hypostases or hypostases. That's the what the patriarch said. So Shamash as I explained that so the people understand what you're saying. Yes. So Ishoya was uh, the patriarch of... Isaac of Nineveh, which is a saint venerated in the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Assyrian Church of the East. So he's a mutual saint between us and he's post-schism. Uh, so this patriarch was patriarch from 628 to 646, which is well after the schism. And he says that, on which side shall we number them? I do not know. For their terminology cannot stand up as nature, talking about the natural world, and scripture testify for in these Many kanume can be found in a single nature, kiana, but that there should ne there should be various natures in a single kanuma has never been the case and has not been heard of. So mm. for us in the Syriac Orthodox Church and the Assyrian Church of the East, kanuma and kiana 
cannot be separated. For a kiana to exist in the real world, it must have a qanuma. So I, mm-hmm. I'd like to get into uh, what kiana means and what qanuma means. Exactly. So, so, so I want, before Zai, let me make sure they got your point. So you guys understood what the patriarch saying. And the Syrian Orthodox Church and the Assyrian Church of the East agree. If you have more than one kiana, they're going to explain it. You have to have more than one knuma. So you guys understood what he's saying because now they're going to define the terms. They're doing it for your benefit. That's why we're going to go slow. That's why we're going to do multiple parts. So you understood what the dilemma is, and now they're going to be discussing it. Everyone understood that? Because mm-hmm. yes. this is for us. I'm le- By the way, I'm learning too. I'm learning all this stuff. So with that said, brethren, now you and Daniel, go ahead. Thank you. So I'd like to start I'd- off with right. Kiana. So Kiana for us, when we speak of Kiana, we speak of it as nature and abstract. So we say Kiana and Ashaya. So what would that be? That would be the common elements found in all members of the human species. It's universal, right? So what would, this would be, for example, we are corporeal. We are in time, right? We are, uh, we're not, we're mortal. So that would be a property that's shared between all of mankind. It's a uni- it's universal. And nature, when it's abstract, we're saying that it's in the mind. It's not something that's existing in the real world as a qanuma would be. So, uh, Subdeacon, if you have anything to say about that. Absolutely. I'm looking for, I have the Church of the East liturgy uh, in my hand right now. And that's um, what I have. Yeah. yeah, there's a part before the gospel reading um, you know what I'm talking about, Shamasha, where he says, uh, yeah. That's what it's yeah, that, that, that that, before the gospel. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is something that you have to have because it's corresponding. So you, it's he, he, like you read from your patriarch, it's unheard of to say there are multiple kiane in a single knoma. It doesn't work like that. So this is why for us, we have one knoma from two. And one kiana from two. They're always corresponding. Yes. You have tre knome and tre kiane because it's, it's a one to one mapping. That's what yes. It is. You can't have one knoma and tre kiane. This is illogical. It doesn't work like that. In our yeah, life. grammatically it doesn't work and naturally it does not work. So this is going to be super deep, guys, because if you heard what he just said, it's going to take me like 50 sessions or 50 times to hear this. Now, hear what the Miyafa site position is. I want to repeat what Daniel said. I'm going to be the guy who's going to simplify it for these, for my brothers and sisters because I'm learning too. So because the Miaphysite position is that after the union, there is one composite nature, one nature, right? Jesus is truly divine, truly human. But after the incarnation, because of the union, it's now one nature. It's one knuma. That's a Miaphysite position because it's one composite nature. But the Assyrian Church of the East speak of two natures, that even after the union, it's two, na- two natures. So if it's two natures, it has to be two qanume. Tr- you understand the logic? This is the debate between the Miaphysites and the Diophysites. I just want to make it, guys, I hope you don't mind. I'm trying to make it clear for all of us. And notice, notice the debate. The debate is not defining terms. We are, we are agreeing on what the terms mean. We don't have to define terms with each other. We're disagreeing on the conclusion. We're disagreeing on the result. So with the Cal- with the Imperial Chalcedonians, let's say the Eastern Orthodox or the Roman Catholics, we have to sit down and make sure we mean the same thing by the word back and forth. But that's because they're using new definitions. And it's not really us as Syrian Orthodox. Usually it's the cops who are talking to them. With us, we're usually talking to the Church of the East. So with us... And the Church of the East, we don't have to redefine terms. The cops don't have to redefine terms with the Church of the East because we're still using the original way that the terms were intended to be used. Hmm. Even the cops, huh? Even, but what language is the theology of the Coptic church Greek. in? Greek. They use Greek. Yeah. Oh, but and you guys still agree on the term. So you agree with hypostases having the same term as knuma? Yeah. Yes. Because that's how it was for Cyril as well in between the stories. They weren't disagreeing really on the terms. They were disagreeing on the conclusion of the Christology. Is it one or is it two? Is it two of this or is it one of this? The the Suraya world, Sam, the Suraya world, we have very little to do 
with imperial conflict. We were in our own world, if you will. We we're in a corner by ourselves. The cops were the ones on the front lines on at the councils dealing with the imperial stuff. We were talking with each other. Church of the East Syrian Orthodox, we were talking with each other about these things. We don't like that. We kind of left that for them most of the time. There were exceptions, but most of the time. So to make it clear, guys, the Coptics, when they use hypostases or hypostasis, however you want to pronounce the term, they kept with the original initial definition, right? So that in Greek, hypostasis would be pneuma in Syriac. Mm -hmm. So they're defining hypostases the way the Assyrians define pneuma. These two terms in two languages mean the same thing. It has the yes. same meaning in Greek and Syriac. So they agree, hypostasis means pneuma. It has the same meaning as pneuma in Syriac. And so the debate is, if after the incarnation, there is now a composite nature, so we don't speak of two natures, we speak of a composite nature, so the Coptics and the Syrian Orthodox say, then there's one pneuma. The Assyrians say, no, it's two natures united in Christ, parsopa, person of Christ. So there's two pneuma. That's their debate. Yeah. So I, I want to right? I want to give Shemesh Isaiah the opportunity to say to to give his perspective on the question of when we say tlathaknome, tlathaknome in the Trinity. Three, there are three gnome in the Trinity. Yeah. Right, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are the tlathaknome, the three gnome in in God. So. Then when the Assyrian Church of the East is saying, Maran, our Lord, has a tre knome, so then that's four. One, two, three, four knome. So go ahead, Shamasha, if you can answer this. And by the way, folks, people are getting it. Yes, guys, you're getting it. You're understanding. Glory to God. That's why I want to make it very clear, and we're going to do several sessions. There's no need to rush. Yep, you're getting it. Okay, so you guys got it. Go ahead. Yeah, so when you look at humanity, right? To be a part of humanity, you must possess the human nature, right? They be a part of the human universal. So when it comes to the humanity of Christ, the reason that we don't say that it's a part of the Trinity, uh, economically, if we can put it, I don't know how else to put it. We don't believe it's a hypostasis of the Trinity because it's external to the Trinity and the flesh, although united to the divine nature of Christ it doesn't possess in itself the divine nature of Christ right so they're distinct that's it's external to the Trinity so it wouldn't be a Hanuma of the Trinity because it doesn't possess the divine essence in and of itself so okay. like when you look at the humanity of Christ it's an it's an instantiation of a human universal it's a particular of a human universal it's not a particular of the divine essence so it couldn't be a part of the Trinity and and the thank you, Shamasha. And the last things I wanted you to address on the Church of the East side, uh, I can. Can you bring the quotes? Two quotes. There's two quotes here. You, I've already told you about. And Majid wanted to yeah. share something in the story is too. He said in the private. I don't know what he said. Yeah, it was something about just to prove what uh, Subdeacon Zaya said about. The well, sure. and Saint Cyril not agreeing on the terms, like they had agreed on the terms. It was more about them not agreeing on the conclusion. Yeah, that's what we said. Yeah, so it wants yeah. to show that. Feel free. Sure. Sure. So sure. now go ahead, Matt. Share that quote where Nestorius and Saint Cyril, they agree on the terms, but they come to different conclusions. So we'll and then I'll put icons uh, slides. So you have your slide, Magic? Yes, here. Okay, let me do this. Do you want me to read it or? Yes, please read it. Okay, yeah. So this is from Saint Cyril, and he says, to these critics, it must be said that there is no obligation to shun and reject everything heretics say. They affirm many of the points we too affirm. When, for example, Arians declared that the Father, to be creator of the universe and Lord, must we on that account shun these affirmations. The same holds good of Nestorius, if he says two natures, to indicate the difference between the flesh and God the word. The point being that the nature of the word is other than that of the flesh. So both agreed that the flesh and the word are not the same in nature. However, 
he fails to affirm the union along with us. We unite this, acknowledging one Christ, one Son, the same one Lord, and further, one incarnate nature of the Son. Mm. Wow, that's St. Cyril, huh? Thank you, Majd. Man. Now, guys, I want you to understand what he just read. St. Cyril is affirming meophysitism, one incarnation of the Son. It's Nestorius who's arguing for deophysitism. Isn't that ironic? Uh, but what, while ICANN's getting the the, the quotes up, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, just a, just a follow up, Shamasha, to the, oh, the Glathoknome thing that I had asked you. Um, uh, so we believe, and you guys believe this too, uh, that in the Trinity there are Tlatha Parsope, right? Yep. Okay. So the Tlatha Parsope for you. In the Trinity, the three parts of play, the three prosopa, they have four gnome or no? Okay, now, let me explain what the question was because you said tlatha, parsopa, and then prosopan. Remember, some people are coming in. When the Assyrians say tla parsope, meaning three prosopan, that's in English we would say three persons. So what he's asking is when the Assyrian Church of the East says that the Trinity is three persons, tla parsope, which comes from prasopan, three persons. So the question was again, Shamasha, what was the question to so, Shamasha? So do the three parsope have four gnome? So yeah, so are these three persons of the Godhead, do they have four gnome? And that's the debate, what that term means, hypostasis. Uh, now, for those who don't know Greek too well, how would you define hypostasis in English for them before he answers the question? A particularized yeah. essence, uh, concrete reality. Yeah. It would be, the concrete, concrete. Yeah. It would be okay. the concrete of the abstract. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Define those terms. Brother, I know some of us won't know. What do you mean concrete abstract? Like here, a brother, Chris Kramer, man, what do you mean particular and universal? So, for define example, concrete. Yeah. For example uh, so, oh, Sam, Sam is a particular member. Of the human essence. That would be a gnoma. Yes. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. So you it understand now? The same thing? Thing. And then gnoma is specific, so it belongs specifically to one. So let's say that Subdeacon Daniel, his height, his hair, that's specific to him, while it's not specific to me. But what's specific to all of us, or sorry, universal to all of us, would be what's you know, like the common elements found in the human species so that would be mortality right so things like that like yeah, yeah. so chris gamer everyone understand what a gnoma is and here human nature that's universal we have nearly eight billion humans that means all of us have this common human nature and so there are commonalities among us that we're born we grow old we sin and die that's common but in this human nature you have nearly eight billion gnome apostasies right instantiations i am a particular instance of human nature so gnoma means a particular instance instantiation of a nature that is common right so this is what they're saying so remember what gnoma is gnoma is a particular example a particular instance of a nature so you have human nature that is something universal to these nearly eight billion people so we have commonality because we possess that nature what's common we're born you can't be human if you're not born you grow you can't be human if you don't grow you die until the lord comes so you guys understand the term now now go ahead so uh shamasha if you want i can repeat the question or if you yeah i got yeah so you can repeat the question for the audience i think that would okay. be better so the the three the parts three of the four. trinity have a sum total of four gnome yeah, so the father, the person of the father has one pneuma. The person of the son, which is one person. So the, the person of the son, that, that's what, so the subject of the incarnation is God the word. It's the person of God the word taking to himself another pneuma. That's external. So would that pneuma be a part of the Trinity? No. But would a member of the Trinity have two pneuma, which would then basically to four, even though one is external, the answer would be yes. Thank you, Shamash. Repeat that last, uh, as you said, 
So for what again? So they understand it because because speak a little slower so we can get it. What did you say yeah. about the last part? Say it again. Yeah. So there would be so there's the person of the father which has obviously a khanuma because khanuma and parsopa are come or in the ordinary they're linked. So uh, the father has a uh, khanuma. The son has two khanuma. So it would be God the Word. The subject of the incarnation is God the Word. To yes. his person, he takes on a human khanuma. And that yeah. person is communicated to the humanity. He's not taking in another person. He's communicating his personhood to the humanity. So there is an external khanuma that is united to the person of the son. And then the Holy Spirit obviously has a person as well. So that would be three persons that with four knuma, but one knuma is external to the Trinity. Let me break down for all those. You guys don't mind if I break it down. So Yeah, of course. Right, yeah. So you can correct me to see if I'm not getting it. Okay, so you understand what Shamash Isaiah said? The Assyrian Church, you see how technical these discussions are, my brothers? Anyway, the Assyrian Church is the saying that Father, Son, Holy Spirit are three parsope, which in English would be persons, but each parsopa is a kanuma because each parsopa person is a particular instance of the divine nature. Are you guys getting it? Please bear with me, guys, if we go slow. I hope you guys don't mind, right? Because, you, like I said, you'll be here for weeks to come if you want to because I'm not in a rush. But I want everyone to get it. So the father is a person of deity, parsopa, but he's also a kanuma because he's a particular instance of the divine nature. So if you have three persons of the divine nature, that's three instances of the divine nature. So three kunume, three parsope. So if the father is a person of God, then he's a particular instance of the divine nature. So he is a divine person and a divine kunoma. Three persons, three kunome. But then the son takes on a human nature. And now he becomes a particular instance of human nature. So now he has another gnoma, but he doesn't become another person because it's the divine person, in lack of better terms, a divine person that is giving that human nature its personality and personhood. So he's still one person. But since he took on another nature and he took on <clears throat> human essence, and so now he's another knuma. He's saying now that there are four knome, four instances. One external to the Godhead because that human nature is not part of the Godhead. See how complicated and confusing it can be? But you guys understood what he's saying? So he's asked, are there four knome, meaning four particular instances? Yes. Why? Because you have three instances of the divine nature, and then you have an instance of the human nature. So there's four total, but that human nature is not part of the divine nature, and it only belongs to the person of the Son. I hope yeah. I made sense out of it for you guys yeah. to get it. You yeah. did. Yeah, well, you said, did. well said. I want them to get it because, well yeah. guys, so, you're going to need to go to Oxford Philosophy School for 40 years to figure out what this is all about. But go ahead. Uh, so just to be clear to the audience, this, what we just explained and described, this is what the Church of the East believes. The Syrian Orthodox Church does not believe this. We believe there's three parsope and three knome. That's it. There's not. Damn, there's, this guy got it. There's, Damn, uh, this guy. So the, there's. Oh, God, uh, he heard it, cut you off. He got it. Bam, you got it. So in a series, tried to get both natures of Christ, individual person. You got it, dude. Damn. Go ahead. All right. Go ahead. So so the, the, the second knome of the Trinity, that God the Word, when he became incarnate. Uh, so there was a, a union of a Knome, and then there is one composite Knome from the two. That's what we believe. Um, now, uh, when we get, I want to just ask Shamasha um, his, his view as a uh, sub uh, um, two quotes. Two the saints of the Church of the East, and then we'll move on. Um, so uh, ICANN has on the screen uh, Theodore of Mopswestia, who was a student of Theodore of Tarsus. Both of these men, Theodore and Theodore, were huge uh, biblical uh, commentators. 
and uh, leaders of the of Diodor's school. Um, and uh, Diodor was also the teacher of Chrysostom, St. Chrysostom. Um, uh, and Theodore was the teacher of Nestorius, like it says on the screen. And, and, and one, we, and our we, account, and one of the founders of Inquisitism, he is condemned in our church as a heretic. Um, now, uh, if you can go on to the quotes, please. Okay. So Theodore is the teacher of Nestorius? Theodore is the teacher of Theodore. Theodore is the teacher of Nestorius. And that's Theodore of Mopsustia? Yes. And now, was he also the teacher of Augustine? Yes. Okay. Now, now, uh, Theodore, Theodore was the student of Lucian of Antioch. Lucian of Antioch was the nephew of Paul of Samosata. Keep oh, that in mind. That heretic? Yeah. So here we go with the quote. I'll read the quote. And Shamasha, you're going to answer. We're not going to, I'm not going to argue about it. You just don't, I just want you to give your church, the Church of the East perspective on this. Uh, Jesus says, this is commentary, not on John 6, on John 12, 32. That's the source. This is found in Richard Price. Um, Richard Price's book, The Acts of Chalcedon. Okay. Jesus says, I do not trust in my own strength, but through the nature which indwells in me, I hope to conquer Satan. God the Word made me his own once and for all time when he assumed me. And it is clear that he will not leave me to act at random when therefore Damn. the God of all hears our judgment and sees that Satan has inflicted death on me unjustly and undeservedly abusing his tyranny against me. He, God the Word, will order me, Jesus, to be freed from the bonds of death with the result that I shall then have confidence to pray to God for all the children of my race so that those who share with me in the same nature may also participate in the resurrection. Go wait, ahead. wait, wait. No, wait, wait, wait. Hold on, Shemasha. Hold your horses, hold on. Wait, wait, wait. This is Theodore of Mopsustia, an actual quote from him? Yes, this is his commentary on John 12, 32. And so he's having Jesus say, so I want to get this right. And this guy calls him a blessed interpreter. Oh, my Assyrian brothers and sisters. Oh, my goodness. So Theodore is having Jesus say, Jesus say, I do not trust in my own strength, but through the nature which indwells me, I hope to conquer Satan. So Jesus is saying, I don't trust in my strength, like a frail human being like me. God, the word made me his own. So God, the word made me his own. So the human Jesus saying, God, the word made me his own so that you end up with two persons. So I don't want to say two persons or not. I'm going to let, I'm going to I mean, let brother. Say, uh, yeah. Okay, listen, I have no dog in the fight. You know that. My ancestors are Assyrian Church of the East. My allegiance is to Jesus Christ, and I pray I love and glorify Jesus. I don't have allegiance to anyone. A blind man can see this man just taught two persons. And for the love of our Lord, Assyrian Church of the East, I don't know how you're going to justify this. There's no way of getting around it. My Assyrian brothers, you got to condemn this guy as a heretic. This is straight up Nestorianism. I'm sorry. I'm not here to offend you, but I'm not here to dishonor the Lord by trying to be buddy buddy. This is blasphemy. This is straight up blasphemy, if you believe this. And this guy said, Theodore the Blessed Interpreter. Blessed interpreter? That's what the that's what the Church of the East calls him traditionally. I'm gonna have to petition Mar'awal to condemn this guy. But go ahead. I want to see how you're going to just... This is straight up Nestorian from the pit of hell. I mean, we've been asking them to condemn him for 1,500 oh, years. Oh, no. I'm joining you, man, in the condemnation. This is straight up from the pit of hell. I'm sorry, Shamashi. I love you. Huh? My, I was baptized in the Syrian church. I don't hate the Syrian church. Syrian church, you got to associate with this heretic. But I want to see how you're going to explain this. Yeah, sure. So I've spoken with Subdeacon about this multiple times, and I've given him simple responses. And he absolutely is a saint, and what he's saying here uh, can't be understood properly. So if you're going to condemn Theodore for the statement, you'd have to condemn Augustine for the statement, because honest, I don't have a presentation. Like more Theodore, but... more power to that. Anyone who yeah. speaks like so this of Jesus? Augustine says on... Here. Augustine, Augustine says says that? On some... Augustine says on Psalms 27. I don't have a presentation. I don't I'd like to see that. I mean, uh, listen, Shamash, I'm not trying to cut you up. No, I'm not here to fight you. If you show me a quote from Augustine, I'll be the first to condemn him, even if the Catholics okay. condemn me. Anyone who speaks of God this way, that Jesus, and my own strength through the nature which indwells me, I conquer Satan, but I don't trust my strength. This is, brother, 
I don't care what you say. This is blasphemy, man. So if Augustine okay. said it, I'll condemn him too. Okay, no problem. So the explanation for this passage is that... So first, let me establish who he's talking to. He's talking, his audience here is against Apollinarians. So this is contra Apollinarians. So what he's doing is he, spe he clarifies as well that this is in contemplation. So he's demonstrating. So this is a grammatical thing. Right? There he clarifies there's one person by speaking grammatically as if there's two to indicate that Christ has a rational humanity. It's not a humanity that is like, uh, is like an empty garment that the word is wearing. It's a humanity with rationality. So he's speaking in contemplation, which Augustine does as well on his commentaries on Psalm 27 too. Right? When he, when he's... Shamasha, when you're explaining this, can you also relate it to how um, the imperial Chalcedonians essentially believe the same thing? No, I'm just going to defend Theodore right now, and then uh, we can get into okay. it. Okay. I want to answer you because the rationality, because oh, my question would be, that rationality that makes the human nature a rational soul, is that a distinct personhood? No, it's not a distinct personhood. So it's still the divine logos, right? Yeah, the reason... So the divine... Well, Shemaj, just engage me here, because I'm not that smart. So the divine logos is basically play-acting, saying, I, the divine logos, do not trust in my own strength, but through the nature which indwells me. So it's the same divine locus who's saying, I do not trust in my own strength. So what Theodore is doing here is because Christ, when he when the word took on humanity, he took on as well human desires. That's why St. Paul says that Christ, although without sin, was tempted in every way that we are. So when God, the word took on humanity, he took on as well human desire that's why in reality there's two wills even if they is a convergence of will there is still two wills so when he's speaking this way he's speaking to show that the flesh of christ it's not an empty humanity it's a rational flesh and again this is in theodore but it's the logos, right yeah god the word took on humanity it is the but one, it's the god the word speaking right see i'm not trying to give you our time but Listen, brother, we have to be honest to Christ, our allegiance to Christ more than any man. Even what you're telling me, you still end up with the one Logos speaking as if he is weak and powerless without God the Word empowering him. That's two persons, buddy. But to be fair, Sam, Leo says the same thing. Are you kidding me? Speak it's, a it's in contemplation. Oh, boy. Yeah. It's, it's in contemplation thing. Augustine says it as well. And it's a thing to show Augustine, the rationality. Augustine was Leo's like, teacher, by the way. Hold on. Hold on. Just like this. Just like I wish I had stayed speaking, stupid, man. I should have should have just stayed stupid, not ventured into church. Father speak, no. Oh, sorry. Uh, so when, when no, no. I don't mean to cut you off. No, no. Go so when the fathers speak to Sibelians, right, they're going to speak a certain way to Sibelians to emphasize the distinction between God the Word and the Father and the Holy Spirit. So they're going to speak a different way to emphasize their distinctions, even though there will be times where it sounds like tritheism. It's not tritheism. It's it's a emphasis on a certain aspect of God, just as not just, a certain aspect, just, aspect on um, Christ's humanity. Did he break up or is that me? Are you still there, Shamasha? Yeah, I'm still here. So what I'm saying is that just as a certain father, when they're dialoguing with a civilian. After, no, I'm hearing you, but after these, I wish I had just stayed stupid in my curiosity. I wish I hadn't learned because you guys are troubling me with every session. So let me understand what you're saying. So, so if I understand what you're saying, Theodore does not believe, does not believe that Jesus this Jesus in his human nature would say and did say, I do not trust in my own strength. So he doesn't believe this. He's just using it for rhetorical device. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a rhetorical statement. It's not something that just yeah. like when I go. Yeah. Augustine. Okay. What do you say about Augustine? Go ahead. Yeah. I'm saying Augustine does the same thing. And so does Leo. And so do many other writers. And even when they're speaking about the Trinity at times to, emphasize the distinction between the father son and spirit to their audience so again this is contra apollinarians so he's making he's writing this way 
to em- put an emphasis on his human soul and his human desire that he does have. And St. Paul speaks about this as well. Okay, now I'm trying to be as fair as I can. So did people understand that Theodore was just using this as rhetorical flourish and that Theodore does not think that Jesus could ever speak this way because it's blasphemy? Of course. And that's why, you see, that's why you see his students and those associated with him defending his strict beliefs on one person. Yeah, but do you have anything from him to prove that? Because I understand if someone's sympathetic to a position, they're going to try to defend even statements that are inexcusable. Because I can even make Arius look like a Trinitarian if I follow this route. So what's have, the evidence from this man? Because you troubled me by this quote. This, this quote, I thought I was going to, I was already troubled. The more you're quoting these guys, the more you're messing up my world. We, we, we have the quote from Augustine that is almost the same as this. Uh, no way. Yeah. Where did you come from, dude? Why did you come into my life, dude? I can, I can, I can show it. Go ahead, Mest. Now, Subdeacon, why, why did you come into my life, bro? My life was happy until you showed up. <laughs> okay, show me that quote, Augustine saying this. One second. Yeah. I can send it to you, Mest, and then you can post oh, it. He has it. Right I have it. Oh, I have it. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's the quote, yeah. Yeah. My life, honestly, I, I thought I was smart and I was okay and I was, you know, I knew the Trinity and you guys show up out of nowhere. I don't, what the hell? Go ahead. Okay, read this one. To thee, O Lord, I cried, O my God, be not silent from me. To thee, O Lord, I cried, my God, do not separate the unity of your word from that which I am a man. For as the eternity of your word does not cease to unite with me, it comes to pass that I am not such a man as yeah. are the others. Who are born into the deep misery of this world where your word is not known as calm while i lift up my hands to your holy temple while i am crucified to the salvation of those who believe and become your holy temple Th this is augustine yeah so augustine augustine was the teacher of leo for anyone who does not know um now uh, augustine is not canonized by the syrian orthodox church or the Amer armenian apostolic church um Okay. So hold on, you know, you're shocked. Not only me, I can see reaction. A lot of people are shocked. We didn't know this. Augustine, these were, can you put that up again? One more time. Don't put it on. I want to see this again. Yeah, yeah. Once again. This for my own eyes. So one more time. I want to see this. So this is why it's going to be like 10 sessions in the series because where we're going, I don't want you to go fast. So where's that? Whoever put it up, bring it up again. I want to see that. Okay, yeah. hold on. Well, don't take it out. Don't remove it. So Augustine has Jesus saying to the Father, do not remove the word that's united to me. Do not separate the unity of your word from me, which I am a man. And this is Augustine. Augustine is saying that Jesus is praying to the Father, Father, that word united to me, do not remove him from me. For as the eternity of your word does not cease to unite with me. This sounds exactly like Nestorianism. And you're telling me this is rhetorical flourish again? Now, I want to ask all of you a question. Apart from Theodore Mopsustia and Augustine, I'm scared to ask this question. Did anyone else who wasn't a Diophysite that you say, did they speak this way or did they condemn this language? Hell no. Damn. Hell no. Gregory of Nazianzus writes anathemas against this kind of language multiple times. He does? Yeah, absolutely. Saint Gregory of Nyssa too. Yeah. And, and it's not an explicit anathema, but it's an accusation. Damn, man. Honestly, guys, I was happy with my life. Now you okay. guys are gonna go. So, the, anyway. the last the last quote I want Shamash Isaiah to give the the Church of the East perspective on. So because they have the Church of the East uh Gezire, we say in the Ninway accent. Like uh, they don't have uh, they don't have a voice. So then everybody who says anything about them, that's what it is because they don't have anyone online to, to defend themselves. So Shema Shazaya, you're doing a great job for uh, your church to be that voice for them. Um, uh, the I I can if you could put up the the other quote, please. Okay, well, I can let me get there. This one here. No, this is oh, this is Cyril in comparison. Just so you guys see that this is Cyril on the same verse that Theodore did that on. Cyril is saying, "Christ alone as God was able to pro procure all good things for us, 
Christ draws human beings to himself because the verse is, I will be lifted up and draw many, right? And does not, like the disciples, leads them to another. Here he shows himself to be God by nature and that he does not make a distinction between himself and the Father for it is through the Son that one is drawn to the knowledge of the Father. See, now that's 100% beautiful biblical Christology and Orthodox. Beautiful. Beautiful. I can, can you put, yeah, this is the one. So Isaac of Nineveh is canonized by the Eastern Orthodox and the Assyrian Church of the East. This is the quote. He, God the Word, granted to him, Jesus, that he, Jesus, should be worshipped with himself, God the Word, indistinguishably, with a single act of worship for the man who became Lord and for the divinity equally. For we believe that all that applies to the man is raised up to the Word who accepts it for himself, having will to make him, Jesus, share with this honor. You, you got to be kidding me, man. Shamasha Aziza. Yeah, this, so again, Shemasha, I think this is an actual was, quote. Uh, Shamasha, before you go on, this is an actual quote from one of the Assyrians. Oh, let me let me clarify where this is from. This is from Metropolitan Hilarion Alfayev, who is in the Russian Orthodox Church. He has a book. It's called The Spiritual Life of Isaac the Syrian. And this is his translation for it. Metropolitan Hilarion Alfayev in the Russian Orthodox Church quotes this and then defends the quote saying this is perfectly in line with Chalcedon. Perfectly in line with Chalcedon. That's why this guy is saying, well, I condemn Chalcedon. Hey, Claudio, if it upsets you that I, if I condemn it, then I condemn it and you and get the lot here. These guys think uh, they're intimidating me. So, Shamash, I'm going to let you explain it again, but you understand from an outsider perspective, though my family's from the Assyrian Church of the East, not raised in the Assyrian Church, raised among Baptists and Calvinists, and this is foreign to me, and others who are not raised in the Assyrian Church, and they hear this. You understand, for our, from our perspective, this smacks of what Nestorianism is, two persons. You understand that, right? Okay. So when you look at the quote from Isaac of Nineveh, he obviously did not write, he got the word granted him, Jesus. Those are brackets. That no, no, those are brackets. He, yeah, these are, yeah, is, he is the word, right? Not, that's yeah. Jesus? So, that's yeah. word speaking? So when... Uh, and Baba specifies this, and other saints specify it as well. When they're saying him or using man when applied to quote the human the, the humanity of Jesus, that's to show that the humanity of Jesus is specific. It's not a it's not a it's not a universal humanity. So they often use and um, a Chaldean Catholic priest in his book Theodore of Mopsuestia and the uh, and the Mesopotamian school goes over. And he gives examples that when these fathers father are using Andrew the word he, hold on, when they're using the word he, they're using it to indicate a specific human nature, not a specific human person. And the verses that we give to defend that is Acts 2.22, when it says, when St. Peter says, a man approved of God, a man approved of God. That yeah, God but God is God the Father, uh, Shamasha. I know the context. Yeah. Not the God the Word. Saying, That's God the Father saying, working through Jesus, right? Yeah, it's saying a man. It's calling Jesus a man. So they're taking well, this language to show that. Yeah, exactly. So that's why they're saying when they're using he, it's to distinguish him from okay, other Shemesha, humanity, general humanity. My, my younger brother, listen to me. When it comes to Acts 2, because I'm an exegete, and I've had to deal with Acts 2.22 because of heretics, the context there is that Peter's talking to Jews who do not believe Jesus is God, but they know he's a man. So he's going to start with what they agree. We agree Jesus is a man who was killed, and it was God the Father working through him. That's not relevant at all analogous to this. You're comparing apples and pineapples. Let me explain to you why. Here you have Isaac speaking to Trinitarians, and he's having God the Word, he meaning God the Word, and you're saying he's talking to the human nature, but how do you worship a human nature? Because now notice the quote, he granted to him the human nature that he, the human nature should be worshipped. So the human nature is worship. It's a single act of worship that's from divine equality. So yeah, but the that's reason not that what you worship the flesh, the reason that you worship the flesh is because it's in union, full union with the divinity. And he's just using this language again, like I said, because he's being specific compared to the positions that he's writing against, which again is monophysitism. 
So where we what do you do? Demolish the, okay. I understand you want to do Just be patient with me because I'm trying to give you the benefit of what do you do? It says the man became Lord. So the human nature became Lord. The human nature was adopted at conception. It's not something that the word had by nature. It's something that he gained. So the yeah, only that's reason that we can call, yeah, no, that is what you asked though, because you're saying no, no, no. I said the man nature became Lord. Lord. The man did not become Lord. The Lord became man. When it's saying, when it's saying, the man, he's saying that the man is the human nature of Christ. The human nature of Christ was adopted by the word. That's the context of the passage. It's an adoption. He's taking on flesh and this flesh when it's being taken on is why we can call the flesh lord yeah but human natures are you worshiping the human nature or the divine person you're worshiping the god man christ who has a human nature yeah so that didn't answer my question see this is what happens when you're committed to a position and you have to defend it you're going to have to do everything you can to defend it well if you're comfortable defending it then okay that's between you and the lord but anyway what's next go ahead all right, so I I don't that that was just for uh, Shamasha to to show to everybody that the Church of the East uh, does not believe in two persons uh, according to what they say, and that they and the Chalcedonians have the same uh, same opinions on these things because, like I said, this is a saint in the in the Chalcedonian Church, and uh, this is from a book by the Russian Orthodox Bishop Metropolitan Hilarion not a Syrian Church of the East. Um, now, No, Claudio, let me correct this uh, heretic, because now he's getting on my side. No, you cannot ascribe worship to the natures. You ascribe it to the person if he's God. No. Nice try. Keep it up, and I'm going to send you packing to the doghouse. But go ahead. Mr. Shamoon, I would like to add very quickly that this um, idea of worshiping the two natures uh, the reason that many Chalcedonians feel like they are obliged to defend this, even though their fifth council wrote an anathema, anathematizing anyone who worships Christ into natures. Really? The later Chalcedon yes, very much so. And actually, uh, I can made a fantastic presentation going over a lot of this stuff um, on our channel on the Lion's Den. Now, it, it bears uh, note that the future Chalcedonians, after Second Constantinople, the Third Constantinople era Chalcedonians, especially, who says this explicitly, John of Damascus, who eventually, long time down the road, maybe, we will be exposing his very, very Nestorian uh, proclamations. But one of them is he says explicitly that he worships two natures with regard to Christ. So two natures are the object of worship. But the, the object tell, of worship has tell, to be a subject. Tell Sam about the icon they have. Well, I, I kind of, I, I will say, um, and this will become much more important when we do a presentation on the issue of one will from two wills versus two wills that stay two wills after the union. Because remember, those... Third Council of Constantinople, Chalcedonians, ever since the 7th century. They now proclaim that the Lord Jesus Christ has not just two operations after the union, two powers, but also two wills. And they use, famously, you can ask any Chalcedonian um, cleric this. You can ask any Chalcedonian cleric and they will tell you, almost every one of them, they will bring up Gethsemane. And we will go over that as well, where he says, not my will, but your will be done. And so they believe that there are two conflicting wills. And one of the interesting ways in which this manifested historically was a certain icon, if you can call it that. And to give you a hint of what the icon has, it's called, infamously, the double Pantocrator icon. Pantocrator means almighty, the all-sovereign. So double almighty, Pantocrator. It's literally, and I mean this literally, two <laughs> images, two men, one whose head is above the other's head, directly above, and their halos form a continuous circular halo. And the this, um, this icon, as it is called, uh, there's a... 
it's it's still visible today. It's badly damaged because it's from the seventh century. But um, it was from the followers of Maximus of Constantinople, who is the Chalcedonian's big number one guy for this stuff. And we'll go over a lot of his stuff eventually. Don't you worry about that. So let um, me explain it the people so they don't get confused what you're saying. There's an icon that comes from the seventh century where this icon, you have two men, a head of one man higher than the other. And there's a halo encircling both uniting them. And that's supposed to represent Christ. And it's called the double Pantocrator, the double almighty. Correct. And also to add to this um, contextually, right? The, the history of it. Yes, this is it. This is it. Um, I have to find the citation because I don't have it on me because I wasn't thinking of talking about it today. Um, but they they believe that Maximus of Constantinople's number one right-hand man, you could say, the Pope of Rome, who the Chalcedonians now consider him to be a saint, was the one who actually uh, commissioned this, they believe. Yeah, boy, uh, I think I don't know, man. Uh, why did I have to meet you guys? I don't know. <laughs> okay. and, and just as a as a sort of short response to uh, our friend Kyrie Eleison, all icons being doctrinally correct. First off, there is a sense in which an icon's um, interpretation isn't necessarily perspicuous, but it is one thing for it to not be perspicuous as to what is the orthodox meaning. And for it to be completely, unabashedly, completely uh, heretical. Like, I don't think the the Assyrian Church of the East would do this. And the Assyrian Church of the East has called Theodore of Mopsuestia the blessed interpreter for... Yeah, that's what this guy said, yeah. That's what Ish, Ish, uh, Ishaya and Weah means. Ishaya means Isaiah the prophet. He said the blessed interpreter. Not in my book, guys. I'm sorry, Assyrians. I'm going to probably offend you. This man in my book is a heretic. Not in my book, man. He's no blessed interpreter talk this way. So I'm sorry. I'm not here to offend you, but I'm not here to tickle your ears. But anyway. But Wait till you get what we get from Leo, by the way. This is going to be very interesting. Very interesting. I think I'm going to end up shutting down my ministry and go live in a monastery the way this is going. But go ahead. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, I can or uh, Dioscoros or Mej, whoever wants to go. I think uh, my the Syriac parts between me and Shamasha Zaya. I don't have anything to say. Shamasha, do you have anything for you before the, the cops take it? No, nothing to say. Okay. Nah. I already disliked Theodore of Daniel because of my book by Murray Harris. And now what you did to me, you made me dislike him. The book. I haven't read that book. I'll check it. Yeah. Mention Theodore in the section on Murray J. Harris. John 20, 20, section, he says, Theodore said that Thomas was calling the father's God. Even then, I had a problem with him. I didn't know who he was. I swear I did not know who the man was, that he's a saint in my the church of my ancestors. And now that you go, oh, boy. All right. Okay, but go ahead, guys. I'm just going to try. I'm trying to be fair, honestly, but I can't lie. I'm going to answer to the Lord. If something troubles me, it troubles me. Something troubles me, troubles me. To have a human Jesus speak of the divine word as someone empowering him, and energizing him, and without him, he's afraid of failing. Damn, that is blasphemous to me. That's how I would speak. I need the word, Jesus, the living word, to energize me and indwell me and empower me. I, because I'm a man who's sinful, to have the human Jesus speak of that way, of the divine word. I mean, come on. Let's be realistic. Let's not have allegiance to traditions. Let our allegiance be to our Lord Jesus. We're going to answer to him on the day of judgment. I know we don't want to be unpopular. We don't want to lose our position. The hell with position and status if it means offending the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to answer to the Lord, Shema Shazayah. And we're not going to answer to our parents or to our cousins. You're going to stand before the Lord. I'm going to stand before the Lord and give an account for why we believe this and justify this. Let us fear the Lord Jesus Christ more than men. And I pray I practice what I preach. But go ahead. Let me warm up my coffee. You got me guys angry now. Thank you, guys. Go ahead, guys. You can continue. Okay, so do you guys want me to go over the, the stuff I have on St. Dionysius, or would you like me to show one more thing 
about Popleo because there is stuff from Popleo. Oh, the Popleo. He says something very similar. Yeah, okay. Popleo is important in this place and context oh, because he's the direct, you know, successor. Okay, I don't have anything much prepared on Popleo, but I just wanted to show a very similar quote. I think so. I'll I'll post my I'll show my screen right now. Kai, if you're listening, Kai, please come and save me, Kai. Please. Okay, so, so. Read, let me read them. I'll read them. Okay, sure. Okay. God therefore assumed the whole man and joined himself to him and him to himself out of mercy and power so that each of the two natures inheres in the other and neither changes into the other with the surrender of its properties. Leo of Rome, Sermon 54, Nestorius of Constantinople. I have said the son and I have confessed the two brief phrases both the created nature and the uncreated. The power of the Lord's flesh and of his divinity is the same. The same is the adoration of him who appears and of him who appears not. Who so has? as you can, yeah, as you can see here, Leo and Nestorius, they're saying the same exact thing. The same thing that we just saw in Isaac and the same thing we just saw in Theodore. And Augustine. Him to himself. Himself to him. There, there are two hymns for Leo and Nestorius for all the people who follow the school of Theodore. There's two subjects in Christ. And here we have Leo saying, the whole man, the man distinct from God the Word, this man is a second him, a distinct subject. And same for Nestorius. They say the same exact thing. For Nestorius is the adoration of him who appears and of him who appears not. For Leo, it's joined himself to him and him to himself. That's what I just wanted to briefly show everyone, just to show that this is, this is a consistent, consistent continuity. It's I not can't. just one person. Yeah, I can. Have, do you? I do gotta you, reach out. Go ahead, brother. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I, go ahead. Make I, I can. Uh, do you have the the kingly quote by Leo? I have it ready. If you don't have it, I have it in front of me. So I'm, uh, you know, I, I, I do. do yeah, I have do, it up. The, pl the plan was for uh to save that for a later show. Because there's a lot from Leo on this. I'm gonna read it now. I'm gonna read it now, and then we could use yeah, it. Read it now. Yeah. Just before so, you go, I don't want to check you up because now you see now you got me engaged because I'm learning. Yeah, I'm gonna have it. to. Well, I'm gonna have to talk to William Albrecht about uh, Leo now. Now you guys got me curious. So, just so I can understand, this Leo because I'm not learning. This is Pope Leo. Yes. Yes. Pope Leo. Leo's tone. So I want to ask you guys a question because you know history. I'm learning. I, honestly, I'm learning. And this is not, God knows I'm not putting out because someone said, oh, he's putting on a show theatrics. Yeah, well, the Lord deal with you. No, I'm learning this stuff as they're going along. I, I should have maybe just shut my mouth, not been curious, but that's okay. God wants me to learn this, to shock my foundation and rock my world. To him be the glory. Okay. So this is Pope Leo, right? Yes. Okay. So. Here you're quoting him where the man that Jesus became, he's speaking of it as if it's a distinct subject from the subject of the word. So am I getting this right? Who him? Exactly. Who look, him? look if, you, if you pay attention, God therefore assumed. We know this is talking about God the word, not God, not God the Trinity. This is God the yeah. word because he, God the word is the one who assumed and the whole man. The whole man, a specific individual man, and them together, you have a him and a himself being combined for Leo, being joined together loosely. The, the so very me, same thing for Nestorius. Yes, go ahead. Before you read the second quote, if let's assume, let's assume for argument's sake, because there are Catholics here, if the papacy and papal infallibility were correct. I just want to, the reasoning, because I'm trying to understand it from the Catholic perspective as well. So if you believe the papacy is divinely ordained and the Pope is infallible when he makes pronouncements on faith, then that means that a Catholic who believes Pope Leo is infallible, because he has spoken, he settled the matter, and this is the truth, and it's a non-negotiable, correct? For the Catholics, yeah. That's what I mean, yeah, those who believe in it. Now, is it true, because I've heard this, that you mentioned the Tome of Leo. So at the Council of Chalcedon, when the Tome of Leo was read, all the bishops said, Peter has spoken, the case has been settled? So there were who, there were those who said that. There were those who said, what did, what the hell did we do? Bring the Osoros back, bring the fathers back. Okay. 
All right, for now, so Catholics, you understand, for you now, it comes down to the issue of papacy and papal infallibility. Papacy and papacy. So at the end of the day, for the Catholics, the Catholics, it really does not matter what these Christians said. If the papacy is ordained by God and the Pope is head of the church and he's infallible, he has settled the issue for all of you. So you see it comes down at the end of the day for the Catholics, whether the papacy and papal infallibility is true. Yes. So I just want to make sure. Schumann. Say it again. I would, I would, Mr. Shumun, I would like to add something here, and it's that it's really not even about papal infallibility at the point of the 6th century because this third, the Second Council of Constantinople, it accepted everything that Leo wrote. It accepted explicitly yeah, so the his letters alongside St. Right. Cyril's in one part and in another part. It lists out a bunch of church fathers, but it also includes Nestorians such as Leo. And it says that they accept their writings in every way. Mm. And so this is their own so-called Fifth Ecumenical Council. So as they the call quote, it, they believe here, it. Here's the quote that, that Dioscoros is talking about from the Fifth Council. It says, we further declare that we hold fast to the decrees of the four councils and in every way we follow the Holy Fathers, Athanasius, Hilary, Basil, Gregory, Theologian, Gregory, Ambrose, Theophilus, John, uh, Cyril, Augustine, Proclus, Leo, and their writings on the true faith. Now, uh, this is session one of Constantinople 553. Okay, the quote I wanted to give from Leo that I can will bring on later. Um, finally, this is the quote from Leo. Finally, the Magi fulfill their duty with devotion and furnish themselves with gifts to show in their adoration that they believe in one trinity by honoring the kingly person with gold, the human person with myrrh, and the divine person with incense. Okay. Say that again. Say that again one time. Uh, finally, the Magi fulfill their duty with devotion and furnish themselves with gifts to show in their adoration that they believe in one trinity by honoring the kingly person with gold, the human person with myrrh, and the divine person with incense. Human person? So divine person, human person. And kingly person, because this is uh -huh. very important to understand about the Theodorian Christology, is that they consider both of those things, which so-called united as they would claim, to both be persons. And then they call that conjunction, that jo that basically apposition next to each other, they call it a person, but it's really the concept of Theodore of Mopsuestia's prosopon of unity, as it is called. And so really, it's just a, um, a the set of the two. And so one of the things that St. Theodotus talks about is he, is he kind of talks against this kind of language, but not that he necessarily needs to because it's so blatantly false. Leave that quote of Theodore up there. I'm, uh, you're reading, as you're saying, the union of the prosopon. So let me read what you just posted in Theodore right there on the incarnation. In the same way, also here, we say <clears throat> that the nature of the God, the word is single, and single that of the man, the nature is being distinguished by one person being affected in the union. Okay, now, so then also here, when we take care to distinguish natures, we say that the prosopon of the man, the person of the man is complete, and also completes that of the divinity. My goodness. But when we consider the union, then we proclaim that the person of both natures is one. Oh, boy. So I don't know if you guys got it. Here Theodore says the person or prosopan of the man. So he's translating what prosopan means. So there is a the person of the man and there's the person of the divinity. But then they become unified. Right, so it becomes one person in the union. So you understand what Theodore just wrote? Prosopon of the man, that's person of the man. So there is a person of the man and there is a person of divinity. That's two persons, prosopon. But in the union, it becomes one prosopon. Man, this is Nestorianism then. And because if Nestorian teaches two persons, then Theodore is a Nestorian. Yeah, but but so Theodore, Nestorius, Leo, Augustine, these guys are all saying that they believe in two natures after the union. Nestorius is canonized uh, by the Church of the East, and Theodoret, who's blessed by Chalcedon, uses Nestorius as an example of orthodoxy after Chalcedon. After Chalcedon, Theodoret quotes Nestorius to show, look, it's orthodox. 
Now you see the now the venom is starting because people are getting upset instead of just taking what you have to say and wait to see if there's a response. They're already starting to accuse you falsely. Like here, Ishaya the other day was excited and giddy, is now saying, well, well, random quotes in a word doc must be legit. So questioning your integrity. And then someone else said that the reason why the to Tome of Leo was accepted is because agreed with St. Cyril, but you guys are not acknowledging that. You see you're getting slandered because now people are getting angry and letting emotions get in the way. Look, here's the I mean, maybe they'd like to see what St. Cyril actually says because we started to cover what the Council of Ephesus says. Yeah. They please don't show it to them. And they keep forgetting that at least they're going to have I, eyes listening. Brother in the Lord, I love him. He's listening because he said he's going to come February. So, guys, take it easy. Guy's going to come and give his side. And so what you're seeing is my reactions are alive because this is new to me. And it's troubling for me. I'm going to be honest with you. I can't lie to you guys, but it troubles me, the language, because it's clear if I didn't have someone in my ear, and I just read these quotes. If I read these quotes on my own, I'd say, damn, they're positing two persons that become unified in a person after the union. Two persons, huh? Well, isn't that what Nestorianism is? But anyway, go ahead, brethren. I'm trying to, I'm, it's just, you know, it's anyway. Go ahead. So, um, okay. We have a saint. I, I mentioned him on the last show, St. Philip Zenos. He says, by the way, he was Church of the East and he, he became Syrian Orthodox, this, this saint. So he says, uh, he says, at least the Church of the East, at least Rome is openly uh, Nestorian, unlike the Eastern Chalcedonians who try to hide it, the, the EO. He's like, they try wait, to hide wait, say it. That again? What was that? We have a saint who said, at least Rome and at least the Church of the East is openly Nestorian. They're not trying to hide it. Whereas <laughs> the, he's like the EOs, they try to hide it. They pretend like they're not. He's like, beware of them. Uh, so, um, yeah, can, define prosopon again for our sister. Now, our sister Kiridason is a godly woman, loves the Lord. She's a Eastern Orthodox. She loves the Lord. She's open-minded. She's not antagonistic. But she wants you to define how is prosopon being used in these examples? Person. So it means sure. person. Um, no. So, so for Theodore, uh, go ahead, Simon. Go ahead. No, go, go ahead. ahead. I was no, just going to say. He's your, he's, your, he's your saint. Go ahead. Charles. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so what they're not clarifying is that there is a two-way usage of the term prosopon that was used in history. And Theodore makes use of both. So he does use it as, you know, just ordinary how we would understand person. And another and usage the, that uh, Saint Baba clarifies is that parsopa is the is a, what distinguishes one knuma from another knuma of the same species. So they would be so knuma would be hypostasis, and the other usage of parsopa would be hypostatic properties. So there would be a hypostasis with hypostatic properties, and what you'd call the hypostatic properties would be. Parsopa, that would be the usage of Parsopa that you hear today is like face, it's like a face or like a mask. So that's the second usage of the term Parsopa. Okay, repeat the two meanings of pars Parsopa again so I can clarify it myself. So go ahead. So there's the first meaning, which is just how we understand person just normally, like uh, uh, how the Chalcedonians would use hypostasis as a person, and then there's another one where it would just mean hypostatic properties. So, uh, like a f how Parsopa is used to mean face, that would be the other definition. So it would just be a hype, like it's hypostatic properties. So that's the dual usage of the term. To okay, be so, yeah. to be and so, Zaya, I have it on the screen for uh, you as well. The quote the, from the, uh, Theodore to the, to the Church of the East side. Um, Leo doesn't say anything different than Theodore. He says, we just read kingly person and human person. I mean, what? how is that different? So let me, yeah, so I can help people understand. So you just said one meaning is person, but then you're saying the word parsupa can mean the property of a particular instance, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So what does that mean? The property of a particular instance. So, like, it's hypostatic properties that are specific to it. So, for example, um, what would be unique to it? So, like, when we're looking at, um, he has me, it on for example, I have like my hypostatic properties that are specific to my hypostasis would be 
the color of my eyes or my hair or how tall I am or, you know. But in reference to the Godhead, I know what you're getting at, but I'm saying when he's speaking of the Godhead, they're not physical. What yeah, would so be the there would be uh, property? Uh, so for the father, it would be paternity, which would be like his fatherhood, that he begets the son. And then for the son, it would be um, that he is begotten of the father. And then for the spirit, it would be that he is like the procession of the spirit. So these what? would be... Yeah. Zaya, my brother, you know I love you, right? That's what distinguishes them as persons. You know that, right? Yeah, and those are hypostatic properties. Yeah, but you understand you ended up then saying it means person. No, those are... You hear what you just said? To the, no, those the, are properties the, specific to their person. But that's the property that makes them... Differentiates, differentiates them individually. The father exactly. is the begotten, the son is begotten, and the spirit is spirator. That's how we know they're not the same person. Yeah, and that's the second definition of Porsopa. I guess that maybe that's what I'm saying. And Your I second you definition. PDF. I can, so I can send you a PDF from a Syriac oh, scholar. He, if you're going to keep talking over me, then you're debating me because you're not listening. We can turn this into a debate. Listen so you can understand. I mean, you guys aren't giving me a chance to speak. So. Okay. Shamashio, you know, I can send you the door, right? The exit? I can send you out of here because I know you're young and you're getting excited. Listen to what I said. Your second division definition collapses into the first definition because what makes them unique, the, the unique hypostatic property, is what makes them distinct persons. When you said the father begets, that's how we know he's not the same person as the son. So it's semantics again, because you're trying to justify this. It's not semantics. And the reason is because. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Baba specifies as well that yeah. there are two, two definitions. And the second definition is hypostatic properties. So yeah, it is what distinguishes one Khnuma from another Khnuma. And I have a, document on this from a syriac scholar that i can post in the chat and whoever sebastian wants to brock. see it can uh... no not sebastian brock okay. he's an indian syriac scholar i have a trouble pronouncing his name but i can post the uh, he's done multiple studies on baba and other syriac figures and i can post the document in chat and whoever wants to read about the definition of porsopa the dual definition can read it for themselves okay. i mean it's on the screen it, it says the twofold de uh, definition right there yeah, so let's look at the definition on the screen. Prosopon yeah. is used in a twofold way, for either it signifies the hypostasis, and that each one of us is, or it's conferred, or it is conferred upon honor, greatness, and worship. For example, Paul and Peter signify the apostasis and prosopon of each one of them. But the prosopon of our Lord Jesus Christ means honor, greatness, and worship. For because God the Word was revealed in humanity, he was causing the glory of his hypostasis to cleave to the visible one, and for this reason, the prosopon of Christ declares it, I prosopon to be a prosopon of honor, not of the essence of two natures. Okay, now, if I go with that definition, this is Theodore. Let me go with Theodore. Okay, Theodore. So prosopon means, okay, honor, greatness, and worship. But that's common to all three. The Father, being God, is worthy of honor, greatness, and worship. The Son, being God, is worthy of honor, greatness, and worship. So is the Holy Spirit. So how does that differentiate them? If I'm going by what Theodore says, so I'm not adding, I'm going by your quote, what you just posted in front of my eyes, that is common to all three, unless the father doesn't receive the same honor, greatness, and worship that the son does. So that does not distinguish them. That would actually be part of the essence, because as God, they're worthy of honor, greatness, and worship. So is Theodore making it up as he goes along? All right. But anyway, what's the next one? Okay, I can. Uh, you want to do your, um, where were we? The, let me find it. Um, uh, yeah, it? sure. Let me just make a quick comment. Uh, I wanted to show from Leo about this section, this whole quote. Notice Leo is also talking about three persons, the same way that Theodore did. For Theodore, there's the human person, the divine person, and the person of the union. Leo calls the person of the union the kingly person. Why? That's a good question. Why does he call the kingly person? Why is it a king? I'll tell you why. Because for him, the kingly person is who is being paid, paid honor. It's the divine and human nature in union. 
There's no difference in power, he says. No difference in power. Keep in mind, this is what Nestorius said. Nestorius says the power of the Lord's flesh and of his divinity is the same. So it's clear for Leo that this kingly person is just the unity of the two natures. That's that's as that's what it is for him. The divine person, the human person, and then the person of the union. The exact same thing as, as uh, Theodore. Exact same thing that he says. Per person of man, person of divinity, person of both natures, which is one. And to go back to the quote that we were talking about, the one that uh, Zaya uh, was explaining. Uh, look here. Uh, person, how is it defined by Theodore? It can either mean hypostasis, which in Latin would have probably been substance, or it can mean honor, greatness, worship, or even power, as Nestorius says. So they have the very exact same concept. Leo is not, he's not any, any different than Theodore. He's not any different. And I can show this from the tome as well. Uh, look at this part from the tome. He says, um, Daniel, actually, if you want to read it out for us. Tome of Leo, that one is God, because through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made. And this one is a human being, because he was made from a woman made under the law. So there is the, the one that is God, God for him. Uh, this one, the divine nature, God. Through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made. And then again, this one is a human being, because he... He was made from a woman, made under the law. So you have the divine nature, the one who all things were made through. We know that's God, the word. And then the human being, the one who was made from a woman. And these are distinct for Leo. These, these are two individuals. The very same thing that Theodore and Nestorius and Isaac of Nineveh said. It's no different. And so I just want to show that. And I also wanted to compare it to Revelation 1.18. So let me bring that up real quickly. Um, here we go. This was, this was I am more living. Go ahead, yeah, brother. Go I'm ahead. No, no, I was just uh, saying this was more troubling than the first part. And I'm wondering what you guys are going to do with me in the subsequent parts. But go ahead. I am the living one. I was dead and now alive. I am alive forevermore. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. I By am the, the living one. The one who and the one who died. So the one who died for him is the living Christ one. says. Exactly. The one who holds the keys of death in Hades. There's no... The, the Bible living, doesn't make this... Yeah, go ahead. I don't mean to cut you out. I just want to see what you're saying. The same living one is the one who died and lives forevermore. It's the same one, the same ego. I am the living one. I died. I live forever. It's one and the same. <laughs> exactly. And this oh also God. connects to a couple of verses prior, Revelation 1.8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. And so the Bible doesn't make these types of uh, distinctions that Leo makes. The Bible is a lot more clear than this. And I don't know how, how someone can accept the Tome of Leo knowing this. Now, brother, I only have one problem with you. You use the New, new International Version. And <laughs> yes. That inspired the, version. The new, yeah, 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 I know. I know. You need to repent, man. I, you know, I used to have high hopes, right now I know you're a heretic, but go ahead. My bad. <laughs> My bad. Yeah. Uh, okay. Now I want to discuss someone very important, St. Dionysius the Areopagite. Have, have you heard of Dionysius the Areopagite? No, no why, is he, why is he important? Explain to us. No, I'm learning. Why is he important? Yeah, that's the plan. Well, Paul mentions So, yeah, you know, in Acts 17, when St. Paul, he goes to Athens and he preaches to the Areopagites and he convinces yes. them of the truthfulness of the Christian faith. One person, one person one is specific converted. Uh, that the Bible mentions by name, Dionysius the Areopagite. And we have a whole collection of his writings still present with us today. And it's a very, a very important collection. Uh, I'll mention his relevance. It's, it will be useful against Islam because his writings are, they discuss the Trinity, they discuss, they, uh, discuss important theological topics, and a lot of things that Islam would oppose. It's also, it's also useful against Protest, uh, Prot Protestantism because he talks about the church hierarchy, the liturgy, and many other things. But the question is, are these writings, are these collection of writings authentic or not? Some scholarship says they're not. Hmm. But actually, very recently, uh, Craig Truglia, Truglia uh, an Eastern Orthodox apologist, he's, had, he's done a, a stream on the topic with 
uh, the scholars Dr. Anthony Pavoni and Evangelos Nicetopoulos uh, mm. on their new book, The Life of St. Dionysius, the Areopagite. And they prove the authenticity of his writings. And I'll briefly go over a very, 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 very short summary. I think if anyone wants to go into a deeper summary, they should, uh, um, they should re read the book for themselves and watch the live stream and all of that. But anyways, I'll go over uh, the brief points. So there are three reasons that scholars say it's not authentic. Number one, no early citations from him, and Maxim and they say that Maximus was the first to commentate on him. Maximus, who was called the confessor, they say he's the first commentator, and they say there's no early citations. Thanks. Now that's problematic because Maximus says that Dionysius of Alexandria, who's from the third century, already wrote a commentary on him. That's what Maximus says. So Maximus cannot be the first one. At his time, he already had a commentary on it. Uh, St. Jerome, he cites uh, one of the writings. This writing is called the Celestial Hierarchy. He cites it in letter 18, word for word. Again, St. Gregory the Theologian uh, of Nazianzus. He cites uh, St. Dionysius' Mystical Theology, another book he wrote in, in this citation. And the book that I mentioned earlier, it goes over a lot of this. So this theory is not possible. And another point to bring up is that Proclus, the Neoplatonic philosopher, uh, they say that Dionysius copied Proclus. <coughs> Again, that's not possible. And here's why. It's more likely that Proclus relied on Dionysius. Why? Because Proclus himself cited an unnamed authority uh, when he said the flowers and super essential lights. No one before him says this. We only know that the only other person who, sa who says these words are Dionysius. So it's far more likely that Dionysius is the source of source of Proclus, not Proclus being the source of Dionysius. And one more thing they argue for is that it's anachronistic to say that that way he used hypostases. Once again, the Bible uses it this way. St. Hippolytus used it this way. St. Clement, Origen, they all used it this way. So it's not anachronistic and it's very, very, it works with the time. And if anyone wants more details on this topic, they should definitely... Uh, get the book. So, or let me, even, yeah, yeah. Who's saying it's anachronistic to use hypostases or hypostases, uh, hypostases as a point? <laughs> this is just one of the uh, couple of points that scholars bring up uh, to argue against its authenticity. But almost every oh, single Christian I tradition, see. yeah, yeah, every Christian tradition, uh, Oriental Orthodox, Roman Catholic, uh, Eastern Orthodox. Even Church of the East, they all accept him as authentic. They, all their fathers do. Maximus does. Damascene does. Aquinas does. Uh, all the fathers of the Church of the East, all the fathers of the Oriental Orthodox. And his authenticity was never doubted by anyone until the Renaissance. I see. Let me explain. Was... Go ahead, yeah, brother. Go ahead. Finish your point. I want to help this brother understand what anachronistic means. But go ahead. Finish your point. I want to explain. No, that's something. all. That's all. That's, yeah. that's all I have to say. Uh, Pedro, anachronistic means you read back into the past, you read back into the past, later meanings and definitions. So if a word means this today, then you assume that is the meaning 2,000 years ago. So later, the word hypostasis meant person. But that doesn't mean it meant that earlier on. That's what anachronistic means. Anachronistic means taking a definition of a term today, and reading it back into the past as if that's how they use the term. That's what anachronistic means. So here the argument is that this book can't be genuine if he's using the term hypostasis as person because it wouldn't have that meaning at that time. And he's showing, no, that's not true. So, yeah, that's exactly. The point. Yeah, exactly. And so now, what is the relevance? Why am I bringing, what is the relevance of his writings and all of this? Again, yesterday I talked a lot, I mean, not yesterday, but a couple of days ago, we talked a lot about the Tome of Leo, how Leo talks about each form does what is proper to it in cooperation with the other. The word, God the word performs what belongs to God the word, and the flesh performs what belongs to the flesh. One of them sparkles with miracles, the other succumbs to injuries. So he's saying that God, the word, is the one who does the miracles and the flesh is the one who's uh, uh, having the injuries done to it. And that each one has its own action. And this is the two natures for him. This is what he believes the natures are. Now, I want to compare this to what St. Dionysius, the Areopagite, the student of St. Paul, 
the one who's converted by Saint Paul, the one who's mentioned in the Bible in Acts 17. What does he say about this? Let's see. For the rest, not having done things divine as God, nor things human as man, but exercising for us a certain new God-man activity mm -hmm. or energy of God having become man. Attributed so, to the person. Mm. Exactly. So he doesn't do just things divine as if he's solely God. He doesn't, he doesn't do things as if he's solely God or other things as if he's solely man. But every action of his is done in the God-man way. Why? Because he is the God-man. He's, he's not person. God alone sometimes. Yeah, and he's not man alone sometimes. He's always the God-man. And so here we see this clear opposition between Dionysius and Leo's tome once again. And Let me explain. Actually, go ahead. Before, yeah. Now, brother, understand what he's trying to show you, that later on you'll find people attributing the actions of Christ to one of the natures. So as man, he slept. <coughs> as God, he raised the dead. But he's showing you that prior to that, what you'll find is an emphasis on the union. So they don't distinguish that. They don't say, well, Christ as man slept. Jesus, the God-man, slept. The God-man raised the dead. The God-man ate. The God. So they were clear in affirming the union. They didn't speak of Christ in such a way where they would attribute one action to his human nature and another action to his divine nature. So you understand what he's trying to show you. So here in St. Dionysius, if it's the same St. Dionysius that was converted by Paul, and that's what he's trying to show you, it is, that when he speaks of the activity of Christ, he doesn't <laughs> distinguish Christ as man slept, Christ as man wept. No, Jesus, the God-man, the one subject, Jesus created the world. Jesus sustains the world. Jesus slept, Jesus raised the dead, Jesus died, and Jesus raised himself. Because they're attributing these actions to the one self-same person who's both God and man simultaneously. You understand what he's trying to hammer? Exactly, exactly. Go ahead. And I want to show the continuity between Paul, St. Paul the Apostle, who converted to St. Dionysius, according to the church fathers. <coughs> Um, so I'll focus more on the on the bottom two quotes. Uh, Daniel, if you can go ahead and read out the quotes for me. All right. Saint Ephraim the Syrian hymns on faith hymn 10. Though your nature is one, its interpretations are many. There are narratives exalted, intermediate, and low. Uh, can I comment on that before I read the rest? Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so Saint Ephraim, uh, this quote, there are opinions on um, the context for it. Uh, regarding the Trinity, regarding the one nature that Christ shares with his Father, etc. Um, I think a more explicit one was the one I read last time I was on there about the mingling of the natures. He says, the natures mixed like pigments, St. Ephraim said, and out came a new color, the God-man, he says, St. Ephraim. Um, so that's a, that's a good point. Uh, yeah. Some people some people make this argument. And so I want to show the context, actually. Let me go ahead and... Uh, uh, show this tab. Okay. So here, here at line three is where he says, though your nature is one, its interpretations are many, there are narratives exalted, intermediate, and lowly. What does this mean? What does this mean for him? Who is he talking about? Is he talking about the Trinity or Christ? Okay, let's keep reading. Deem me worthy to gather the crumbs of your wisdom. Your exalted narrative is concealed beside your begetter. So the exalted narrative he mentions here, there are three narratives, exalted, intermediate, and lowly. The exalted one is concealed beside your begetter, the one who begot you, so next to your father. So this, this is talking about the incarnation. This is talking about Christ. And furthermore, he says in the, uh, line five, for if John, the great one, called out, I am unworthy of the straps of your sandals, my Lord. There it is. Again, it's about Christ, about the sandals of Christ even, which is the lowly interpretation, the Wonderful. humanity. Exactly. And I think there was one more down here somewhere. Maybe not. Uh, but yeah, the whole. Oh, yeah. Here, right here. Verse nine. When the Lord came down to earth among mortals, he made them a new creation like the watchers within which both fire and spirit mingle since fire and spirit exist secretly. So, again, it's very, very explicit what he's talking about. 
the lowly interpretation is when he became incarnate. The exalted is when he was begotten of the Father before, before all ages. And the intermediate is maybe the miracles. Uh, I'm not too sure. But the point is, this is clearly talking about the incarnation, about Christ. And he says, your nature is one. Yeah. Okay? Thank you. Okay. Habib. Yeah. Okay. Thank Go ahead. And uh, can you... Well, before you the next... well, let me Go make ahead. a comment. No, yeah. Just I want to comment. It. Now, uh, as some are saying, saying, yeah, well... We we are just affirming the fact that though he's the God man, God does not sleep in the sense that in divine nature he's ever living. So that's not my problem there. I'll tell you what my problem is so people understand where I'm troubled. <laughs> I just want to understand where I'm troubled. I'm not troubled with that. What I'm troubled with is when Theodore and the others they quoted speak of Jesus the man, where he, Jesus the man, speaks as a weak, frail human who's afraid and is looking to the word god the word to energize him and protect him that's what's bothering me so i want under people understand where i got messed up is with the quotes from theodore or even augustine <laughs> where you have jesus the man being so distinguished from god the word that the man speaks like me that i don't trust in myself and I trust in God, the word to strengthen me and protect me and enable me to conquer Satan. That's what bothers me. See, I want people to understand. I know you can take these statements, say, I, we have no problem with it. We, we understand he's one, one person and he's the God man and the God man ate. But we're only highlighting the fact that when he ate, it's because he's truly human. My problem is with Theodore and the quote from Augustine, I'll be honest, where they speak of Jesus as a man to such an extent that he is dependent on God, the word for his strength. And he knows without God, the word, he's nothing. That's what bothered the hell out of me. But go ahead. I just want to make it clear. Yeah. Same. And it's, oh, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, yeah, go ahead it's not, go. Okay. It's not even completely wrong to uh, say that he, that he died, for example, because he has a human nature. Yes, he does. But this nature composes his one incarnate nature. The reason it's so important to believe in one incarnate nature is because this one incarnate nature is both divine and human. And so let's say you believe that there's solely a human nature, as Leo does, or that the one that died for us is solely the human nature. What is the product here? How are we saved? If a human nature, a mere human nature, a mere flesh dies for us, how, how are we going to be saved? Where, where's our salvation? Where is God dying for us, as Revelation 1, eight and one eighteen talks about? Sam... Um, um, yeah, go what, ahead. What, Sam, what you see from, let's say, Augustine and Theodore, do you see it in Leo too? From the Leo part, yes. The first quote you gave me, that yeah. messed me up too, yeah. The part from Leo. The uh, first so quote that you read from the tome, that messed me up as well. Yeah. But uh, okay. I, you already left me instead of uh, shock and uh, dumbfounded. And when you read Leo, I was already like, I was gone. You get what I'm saying? I was like in another yeah. world because Theodore shocked me. But then when you quoted Augustine, that really messed me up. And then <laughs> Leo was just icing on the cake. The first yeah. quote from Leo, the Tome of Leo. So uh, I'm hoping uh, I'm going to talk to William. I am. I'm going to call him afterwards and say, hey, brother, you got to got to explain this to me. You got to do some. Uh, I have a I have a Christology show coming up with him on his channel, <laughs> with Dr. Goff, which is their top, no, their top Christology guy. So let's see. Yeah, talk about the, these quotes about Leo, because uh, 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 listen, I have no dog in a fight. Guys, know, guys, know that I'm not here to be for or against someone, but I want to honor the Lord. And when someone distinguishes the Lord to that extent, where you have a human Jesus that sounds frail and he's dependent on God the Word, I cannot help but see heresy and Nestorianism. I can't help it. I mean, you got to be blind, right? I mean, if I'm reading it. <laughs> Wait, the human Jesus that is afraid and he needs the divine word to strengthen him? Well, wait, isn't the human Jesus the divine word? I thought they're one and the same, but anyway, go ahead. Yeah. St. Theodotus of Ankyra. Oh, sorry, sorry. Let me okay, just say yeah, this you real quick. Yeah, yeah, because some people might say, uh, they might ask me where I get this quote from, or, if, uh, or as someone else said earlier, uh, just a bunch of quotes on a Google Doc. No, I have sources for all these quotes. For example, this top translation, this is from Dr. Alois Grillmayer. He is a Roman Catholic cardinal deacon who reposed, but he was one of the main uh, theologians on Christology. And he has, this is from, I believe, his book, 
Christ and Christian Tradition, I believe, Volume 2. I'm not sure which specific one, but I, I know he talks about the Christology, uh, Christology of Leo. And he mentions this quote in specific. He talks about it. And other quotes as well. I believe this is from the official uh, Fathers of the Church Edition translation. Uh, my quote from Theodore. This is from, this Doc, is from uh, uh, Father Jean Ber, uh, Jean Ber, who's Eastern Orthodox. He writes a book called Against Theodore and Theodore. So all these translations, all these quotes, I'm not getting it for myself. I'm not making this stuff up. I have a source for every single one of these. And if anyone would like to ask me more about this, I can definitely provide more sources. Yeah, so I just want to say that. Made up sentences like Justinian did. That would be fun. Yeah, like Justinian, uh, the United States of Jerusalem, who is known to be a forger. The Chalcedonians, they had to make forgeries just to defend their position. This is what Anastasius of Sinai, a saint in their church, he even had a, a sweatshop, basically. Like the, the ones they have in China, just making quotes all the time, fake quotes. And he admitted to this. And uh, I can provide sources on that as well. If he also is. admitted to falsifying a translation of the Tome of Leo. Exactly. And those Woo! interested can well, well, read more about it. But... Exactly. Now, brother, before you move on, one of my mods, before you move on, one of my mods went on New Advent. And he wants that the quote from Sermon was a 54 in the Tome of Leo because this is what he found online. He found this version. So he wants to he can give the reference to look it up. He says, the version I found on New Advent, it says, therefore God took on him whole manhood and so blended the two natures together by means of his mercy and power that each nature was present in the other and neither passed out of its own properties into the other. So he wants to know that particular translation you got, where can he find it? Because the one on newadvent.org reads differently. Uh, this translation would be, let me actually pull up the book itself. Yes, yeah, so he can find it because the one on New Advent is translated differently. Maybe it is. Maybe he's even looking at the wrong translation because... Sermon, was I, it Sermon 54? Yes. Uh, oh, he shall, yeah. yeah guy, okay. So I'll, I'll show you I'll show you the book itself, Sermons of Pope Leo. Let me just pull it up. Right real quick. I, I want to uh, shout out to Yusuf Alib on the sweatshop. Uh, the sweatshop joke that was his. The which one? Yeah, the sweatshop joke. The sweat sweatshop. Oh, there it goes. You got it from this here. Is, yeah, and if you'd like, I can maybe. At a later by date. Catholic University Press by the Catholic University of America. Yeah, right exactly. there. Exactly, and so if you can <laughs> share the link, share the link in private chat, I'll send it to them. But what you say, if you like, you can do what? I can even get the Latin and maybe show it in the next show. Yeah, so please. Please, because sure. you, this guy is a good brother and he's a serious dude and he's not questioning you. He just wants to make sure he has the citations. Sure. Like like Shia just said, you know, give us the references so we can check, you know, of because course, course. people don't understand this is sensitive material. If I bring in Eastern Orthodox, he's going to say things. Oriental Orthodox will get upset and then they're going to question. <coughs> of course. So you expect course. Eastern Orthodox, Catholics, Protestants, they're going to react to this because many haven't heard this. So first reaction is you're lying. Second yeah. action is misinterpreting. This is why it's now archived. Give the references. People can check. So at the end of the day, they're not lying. You may question their interpretation, but I don't need someone to tell me what Theodore said. I just read it with my own eyes, and that's two persons. And if you say it's rhetorical flourish like Augustine, you can quote Augustine and anyone <laughs> else. That doesn't solve the problem because, to me, there are greater men of God that I can be, but they're not inspired like the prophets and the apostles. Exactly. Yeah. Augustine is not Peter. Theodore is not Paul. These men are inspired and the foundation of the church. What they say is gospel truth because the Lord sent them to be the foundation of the church, Ephesians 2.20. Anyone after that is going to be open to criticism. I'm just This is just how it is, right? Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean I don't think they're Christians, but that just means that, no, I can't take it that far. No, this is kind of too much. <laughs> Theodore, I don't know, man. Uh, blessed interpreter, in whose eyes? Not in my eyes, but go ahead. Yeah, and this is why we should also follow the, as you said, the apostles and their their students, like Dionysius, as well as the ecumenical councils, which pledged to to follow the teachings of the apostles, um, such as Saint Theodotus of Ancyra here, who attended the third ecumenical council and presided over it. We talked a lot about him uh, a couple of days ago. And once again, uh, if Daniel, you could read this quote yeah. for me real quick. Of course. Of course. Yeah, of course. Okay. Saint, Saint Theodotus of Ancyra, Exposition on the Nicene Creed. For by saying, Paul's 
became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross about him. Clearly, he is convicted for counterfeiting the faith and for falsely attributing the sufferings to a man alone. Instead, the one who deceived himself with all the definitions of the nature, because he wishes to show the accusation of the cross against the all matter, like having crucified a man alone and not having dared this toward God. Yeah, so here he's writing against Nestorius. Keep in mind, this is the guy who is who was dealing with Nestorius. The Eastern Orthodox, the Roman Catholics, they came centuries later after this guy. This is so, the guy who's dealing directly with Nestorius. So he, he's who defines what the what the Miaphysite Christo or what the Orthodox Christology is in comparison to Nestorius. So and me, here he's saying, yeah, go ahead. Let me let me reply to Indonesian Christians' question. He said, Okay. Chalcedonians do believe in the two natures unified into one hypostasis. Where is the unification of the two natures for the Orientals? So we just went over the first part of the show, Church of the East and Syriac Orthodox. We You cannot have two kiani <laughs> in one gnoma. You can't do that. That's not an option on the table. That's what we were talking about the whole time. So you have, uh, when you say hypostatic union, what is that? The hypostatic union is a union of two hypostases. Okay. Now, for the Oriental Orthodox, we believe after that union of the two hypostases, there is one composite hypostasis. <coughs> this, the Church of the East says they remain two after the union. For us, it's a real union. If it's a real union, that means they become one. They're no longer two. Now, a hypostasis is not a nest, and you have two birds in the nest. Like you, like you're you saying, saying, you're saying is a meeting place of two natures. Where did you get this from? Who of the fathers ever taught this? And actually, Saint Theodotus writes against this, saying that it's a merely <laughs> nominal union, and that's really what it is. And we we will end up getting much more into that. Yes. Yeah, the the plan is uh, actually we'll be showing how the Chalcedonian understanding of two natures uh, and one hypostasis is actually the same as the Church of the East understanding of. To, to Kiana and to Knoma, but one Prasopa. We'll now, be showing that in a later show, though. Yes. Now, so people don't lose the point of this. So Theodotus yeah. of Ancyra is condemning, you're saying, what Nestorius is saying, that he's attributing yeah. the sufferings yeah. to men. So now, guys, understand what Theodor, uh, Theodor, Theodotus saying that to say that Christ suffered as a man alone, <coughs> this is false because you don't want to divide the natures to that extent. So he's trying to attribute the suffering to the one person, right? Yeah. So instead, the one who deceived himself with all the definition of nature, because he wishes to show the accusation of the cross against him to be a small matter, like having crucified a man alone and not having dared this toward God. So see what he's saying? When you say that Jesus died as a man, you're dishonoring the Lord because you're so dividing his natures that you are not seeing that the scandal of the cross is that God died. Exactly. The scandal of the cross, the crime of the cross, is that it wasn't a mere man who died. God died. That man is mm -hmm. God. And as the God man, one unified person, he died. That's the scandal. God was crucified. You understand the point? <coughs> yeah. And this is possible because there's one nature out of two. The one nature is both God and man. So you can you can correctly say God died because the one nature is God. And that it's it's that simple. And this is why these fathers are keep emphasizing emphasizing that the error error of Nestorius was he got lost in all the definitions or interpretations, as Saint Ephraim calls it, of the nature, of the one nature. He doesn't understand that even he he saw the sufferings and he assumed that there must be a different subject from God. Yeah. No, okay. there's one subject. Let me correct this later. Let me. And the Indonesian Christian, if you're going to keep being reactionary because you're getting defensive, you know, I'm going to send you first class ticket to the Valley of Hanam. Stop causing trouble. Stop being a distraction and a pain in the aspirations. They said Nestorius. They said this is a response to Nestorius. However, this serves as a warning to all that do not so distinguish the natures of Christ where you have just the man dying on the cross because that robs the cross of its power and its scandal. The God man died. Stop reacting. It's not about yeah. you. dude. I know you live in your world and you think we're squirrels and we're trying to get a nut and you're going to be having your butt moved in a minute. 
Listen. Go ahead. Uh, I yeah. just want to say, to be fair, again, to the church, <laughs> Theodore and Nestorius and all of their guys have no problem saying God died also. But what they mean by saying God died is different than what we mean by it. Yeah, they say it's by relation. And the thing is, I mean, here you have Leo as well. As a Chalcedonian, why are you defending this guy, Leo? Why are you defending a person who says that the word performs what belongs to it and the flesh does its own and each nature is doing its own actions? Now you're dividing him again. The natures are actions. Okay, the natures have their own actions. Okay, that's nice and all, but now the human nature died for you. Is that really what you want to confess? Do you really want to place your faith no, on a mere human man. nature? Exactly. God man died, and this yes. is, God man died, yeah, yes. yeah. And this is what not just... I want to show these quotes because St. Mark the Ascetic is also a saint in all churches and Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, and Oriental Orthodox. He also spoke against Nestorius, and he tells them not to ask meddlesome questions about Christ's nature. And he, where does where do we learn this from? He says we learned this from Saint Paul. And uh, this is again, it's contrary to Leo. Leo says it's not the same nature that says this and that. But all the fathers say, uh, for example, Chrysostom, Christ, Christ acts now as man, now as God, both indicating the nature. The human actions and the divine actions both are referring to the one nature of Christ. Now wait, Saint Chrysostom, Hillary. before you go on, Chrysostom also speaks of a composite nature? I would say so, yes, based on this quote and based on it's other both quotes. Both indicating the nature, not natures. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, St. Hilary of Poitiers, of course, we do not deny that all his extant sayings belong to his nature. I can also show the Latin for this one. I looked a lot for this quote in specific, and I have a lot on it. St. Ephraim the Syrian, we already know this quote, St. Ephraim the Syrian again, hymns on the nativity, the nature that could not be touched by his hands was bound and tied, by his feet was pierced and lifted up. And lastly, St. Cyril of Alexandria and his second book against Nestorius, and before I say, before I read out this quote, quote I want to say this, this, this writing was accepted by Rome. Pope Celestine of Rome. Pope Celestine of Rome was the Pope during the time of St. Cyril. He used the five tomes against Nestorius that St. Cyril wrote to condemn Nestorius in the Council of Rome in 430 AD. And so this is a universal belief. This was universal belief at the time of St. Cyril, accepted by everyone except for Nestorius. Now, what does St. Cyril say? So just as everything is spoken of the one person, for one nature is recognized as existing after wow. the union, namely that of the word incarnate. So some people will tell you, oh, yeah, 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 we can, we can say everything belongs to the one person, but we also say that some of it belongs to the human nature and some of it belongs to the divine nature. Okay, but St. Cyril says that for it to all belong to the one person, it also means that it all belongs to the one nature that exists after the union. And okay. this was accepted by all Christians at the time, other than Nestorius and his faction. Okay, let me get this straight so we can understand. Besides Nestorius and Theodore, whatever, these Christians, St. Hilary Potiers, you just quoted him. Yes. And then St. Ephraim, though your nature is one, and this is after the incarnation, St. Cyril, one nature so they are speaking of one nature, a composite nature, because he's still truly divine, truly human, but they still say one nature, one nature, one nature. That was the language of these Christians, many of whom are recognized as saints, huh? Yeah, yeah, all of them are. All of them are canonized by all churches except... But you see, you see what, uh, what I from said, <laughs> a nature that could not be touched by yes. his hand was bound and tied. That's right, see? And then, so that people don't try to argue against it because they'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, that's, he's not saying they're in two Well, no, no, read the one before it. Though your nature is one, its interpretations are many. It's clear that Ephraim saying- The word is Kiana, by the way. The word what is, is it? Kiana. Kiana is the word he's using. He's there. writing in Assyrian. And then St. Yeah. Cyril, who's a saint in the Orthodox and Roman Catholic traditions, for one nature is recognized, not just one person, brethren. These are quotes. Unless you're going to say they're lying, it's there. This is history. I don't know what you guys want to do. Now, I, now I, like we said, Kai's going to come on, Lord willing. He's going to see this, so he's going to prepare a response, and we're going to give the other side a chance because I want to be fair. I'm not here to bash anyone. And after this, I don't want you to say, oh, he's anti-Eastern Orthodox. 
I'm not anti-Eastern Orthodox or Oriental Orthodox or Assyrian Church or Roman Catholic. I love all these traditions. But I'm not going to tickle ears if I think someone is espousing heresy. I can't accept them as a saint. Mm -hmm. I mean, exactly. the, I, Augustine is a problem for me right now, what you did with me and Augustine. I had problems with him because the reformers appealed to him and his view of predestination. So he gave me a problem because John Calvin swore by Augustine. Martin Luther swore by Augustine. But then when you quote this, and then you're telling me Theodore was his teacher? <coughs> Not explicitly, but they did have correspondence. And actually, the whole heretical view existed before even Theodore. Uh, it goes back, I know in the West, in the Latin West, Novatius even distinguishes son of God from the son of man in his work on the Trinity. Novatius, uh, who's known as a schismatic, but his work was uh, like kind of a big deal in the West uh, on mm -hmm. the Trinity. In it, he distinguishes the Son of God from the Son of Man, which is something even Nestorius w w didn't want to do. Even Nestorius had to be uh, more clear about his language and avoid it trying to speak of two sons explicitly. So can we safely assume that in the East, the consensus was speaking of one composite nature, and then you had those few exceptions, whereas in the yeah. Latin, they were the not Latin. as precise? Uh -huh. No, I would say even in the Latin West, there were some examples. I would say, uh, for example, Marius Mercator, uh, St. John Cassian, um, St. Hilary, as I showed, and many other examples. And uh, oh, St. Jerome, and I'll, I'll be willing to discuss with anyone on this topic. I've done a lot of research. St. Jerome spoke of composite nature? Uh, he spoke of the substance of Christ, one substance. Are you kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> you, come on, man. You're kidding, right? I'm serious. I, can, I I have the quotes and everything. Like I had, I did a lot of research on this stuff. And, wow. uh, maybe Why the hell did I meet you guys, man? I was okay until you came into my life. <laughs> I can. I'm sorry. Did you? But did you mention popes of Rome, Saints Julius and Felix? Oh yeah, yeah. Saint Julius, Pope Saint Julius, Pope Saint Felix, and obviously yeah, they, they were Saint cited Alexi. at Ephesus. And keep so in mind, no one had a problem. No one had a problem with what Cyril said in the West. Uh, Marius Mercator translated his writings. Uh, Jean Cassian Indeed. approved of them. Uh, yes. Saint Pope Celestine used his writings. He used the, these five books against Nestorius, the same one that I'm quoting right here. He used this to condemn Nestorius. No one paused and said, what are you talking about, man? How can you say there's one nature? That didn't come until Leo, who was a student of Saint Augustine, uh, who, miss, who uh, was wrong, uh, unfortunately. And, and he may I have repented. That, uh, he may yeah, have repented. There's some indication in his writings that he may have repented. And so that's yeah, different. Yeah, in his retractions, uh, the, I think that's the last work he ever wrote. In his retractions, he uh, took back some of his statements. Unfortunately, he never completed the retractions uh, because he reposed prior. But he was also invited to the Council of Ephesus. So we're certain that St. Augustine, if he had been given the chance to understand the true uh, faith, he would have accepted it. Uh, but um, Can I just say something real quick for, go ahead. Yeah. for Sam? Um, Popes of Rome, St. <laughs> Julius and Felix. They are prime examples, obviously, of what the Orthodox Latin tradition ought to be. Well, as it was mentioned in the Council of Ephesus, they had quoted them in its uh, Florilegium. It's a big, a big list of quotes, quote, 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 from Saint, 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 to basically show that it's correct. Well, if you look at the footnote in the Council of Ephesus for Saint Julius of Rome and Saint Felix of Rome, when they talk about Christ, You'll see in the footnote that they claim it's authored by who? By Apollinarius. The mm. Chalcedonians claim that these writings are <coughs> too far on the Miaphysite side that they could not have been written before the Council of oh, Ephesus. Yeah. Wow. And so they must have been authored by the heretic Apollinarius. And oh. that's why part two of my presentation will become very important to give context as to that period of history and what was taught even among those works that pseudo scholarship and also mistaken scholarship will just they'll, they'll assume false things that they shouldn't assume and that needs to be kind of dismantled in an orderly manner but that's just one example yeah Let and, me, uh, go ahead no i just want to make clear what we just heard from you there were popes in the west that affirmed what saint cyril of Alexandria said, so agreeing with his miaphysitism, but then there's a <laughs> note that was attached 
<clears throat> later on saying, well, the statements attributed to St. Cyril, they're not really from him, but they're Apollinarian forgeries because the people were troubled. There is no way St. Cyril could have affirmed Miaphysitism, but you're going to show the evidence shows they're not forgeries. They are from St. Cyril. And so he did affirm Miaphysitism. And so those popes that confirmed those statements were basically Miaphysites. Ephesus 431, Sam, explicitly uh, quotes the so-called Apollinarian forgeries in the ecumenical council. It quotes them and, and affirms their authenticity as an ecumenical council. And it's not about uh, St. Cyril being uh, quoted or they're not saying that his writings are Apollinarians. Uh, it's that what he cited, for instance, St. Athanasius and what Ephesus cited, these are Apollinarian mm -hmm. writings, not by these saints. Awesome. That's what the Chalcedonians did. And they did that after, I think, a hundred years. It, they, like, they didn't do that ah. during the time of Ephesus and Chalcedon. So when Ephesus and Chalcedon has been convened, and these statements are quoted, no one ascribed them to Apollinarius, the heretic. Yes. They actually took it to be <laughs> Gentile. They said Athanasius and others. But later on, because they adopted the physitism, and they saw if this is what these writings, if they're accurate, being attributed to these men, like Athanasius and others, if it's true, then they affirm Miaphysitism, then we're in trouble. So there's no way they could affirm Miaphysitism. So they must be forgeries. Exactly. Yeah. Because and Cyril and Ephesus cited them as authentic sources. Uh, for instance, when St. Cyril uh, um, talks to the bishops of the Orient, meaning like the East, he cites one of the writings of St. Athanasius, and he says this is by Athanasius. Meanwhile, wow. later on, you see uh, um, Chalcedonians such as Leontius saying that these writings are not by St. Athanasius, St. Felix, wow. St. Julius, but by Apollonarius. So in the yeah. councils, they had no doubt Athanasius affirmed Miaphysitism because they were quoting what they knew was from St. Athanasius, St. Felix, and they were quoted with authority at the Council of Ephesus. No doubt these are genuine writings of Athanasius and others, and we agree, Miaphysitism. 100 <laughs> years later, no, 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 no. Athanasius could not have affirmed Miaphysitism. It must be a forgery. Pretty much. And I'll say, I'll say one thing. I'll say one thing real quick. Every, just out of a caution for everyone who might say it's a forgery or whatnot, every quote I've used so far is doubted by no one. I have not used a single quote that is called a forgery so far. But yeah. now I want to show something really quickly. Um, this is Gennadius of, I don't know from where, but his name is Gennadius and he's a Chalcedonian. A Chalcedonian, maybe father. I don't know if they canonize him or not. I think he's he a wrote, Western. Yeah. He wrote this book called On Illustrious Men. As you know, St. Jerome, uh, he yeah, yeah, wrote a book. Man. Yeah, yeah. So this yeah. is a supplement to it. And here he talks about Pope Julius of Rome, the one that we just mentioned multiple times. Is, is this is Gennadius of Constantinople? No, G Gennadius of Messiah. No, no, that's a different guy. That's the guy who wrote against St. Cyril's 12 anathemas, and then the Chalcedonians, after Chalcedon, made him their <laughs> patriarch of Constantinople. Nice. Yeah. So what well, by the way, this, say is, about this is newadvent.org, guys. It's a Catholic yep. website, newadvent.org. Yep. yep. Uh, Daniel, can you go ahead and read out this section for me? Yeah. Uh, so I'm just reading the comment. God bless you guys. As an oh, I am ashamed. I didn't know these things. Well, okay, no problem. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, Julius, Bishop of Rome, wrote to one Dionysius a single epistle on the incarnation of our Lord, which at the same time was regarded as useful against those who asserted that as by the incarnation, there were two persons in Christ. So also there were two natures. But now this too is regarded as injurious for it nourishes the Eutychian and Timothean heresies. So he admits that St. Julius, he wrote an epistle, he wrote a writing uh, where he affirms that just as there were two persons, uh, there were not two persons, there were also not two natures. Wow. But now, because now they accept two natures, it's injurious, he says, injurious, for it nourishes the Eutychian and Timothean heresies. Wow, let me this read that. The Macedonian guy. Yeah, let's yeah, go back, yeah. let me read that one more time. Julius, Bishop of Rome, wrote to one, Dionysius, a single epistle on the incarnation of our Lord, which at that time was regarded as useful against those who asserted that as by incarnation, 
there were two persons in Christ. So also there were two natures. But now this too is regarded as injurious for it nourishes the Eutychian and Timothean heresies. Did you guys catch it? So this bishop of Rome wrote a letter affirming Miaphysitism. There are not two persons, not two natures after the union. One person, one combustion. <laughs> and initially it was regarded useful, but later on it became a problem. And he was cited at Ephesus, the Ecumenical Council, his writings. Wow. So, yeah. Oh, you know, let me tell you my relationship, you guys. I love you guys. Now, if you you guys got 10 minutes more, if you because I don't want to make it like three hours unless you want to wrap it up. Yeah. And you can come back, part three. I'm available next week, anytime. <laughs> let me know it's because you got to finish the series. You can't leave us cliffhanger. But let me share something with you. My relationship with you, I'm sorry to say this, started like with my ex-wife. It was beautiful. But by the end, it turned out to be a nightmare. So I appreciate you guys for making my life more miserable. As you can see, there are several people in the comment section saying, I thought I was near close to finding the church that God wanted me in. But thanks to you, you've delayed our journey by another 50,000 years. So we appreciate you. You're welcome. Now, you understand if I die not settled in any church and the Lord holds me accountable, I'm going to bring you before the judgment seat. I give you my word. I'm going to say, Lord. Ready. I thought I had figured it out, but these guys messed up my world, and I was now more scared than ever to make a decision. So, Lord, if I'm going to be disciplined, can they share in my punishment because they're guilty of what they did to me? So I'm going to call I'm, you before the judgment seat, all right? I'm ready. I'm ready, Sam. <laughs> you are. I'm not. I'm not ready. <laughs> I'm not ready to go before the judgment. The Lord have mercy on me. But if you guys want, you got 10 more minutes unless you want to wrap it up. And part three, we can do it Monday. You let me know. Okay, 10 minutes. Um, let uh, We did the Dionysius thing. Uh, Dioscoros, do you have anything? Yeah, need more than like 15 minutes. minutes. Yeah. Also, if you want anything for these 10 minutes. I'll, I'll wait until the next time to present for mine because we had those three pages after the title pages of my presentation. And you guys all saw, the listeners, some, just some, we're not even done with St. Theodotus homilies at Ephesus. And there's still a lot more to go of Ephesus and the events surrounding Ephesus as recorded by the three saints who presided at Ephesus, where they completely, blanketly condemn diophysitism, the two natures after the union position. It's going to be a bloodbath, but it's okay because it's the blood of the Nestorians. Damn. He, he's, so, he's being facetious there. Just yeah, like, no, but yeah, but yeah, no, no he's kind of, yeah. but so point is, you're going to show in part three, Lord willing, actual documentation, diophysitism or diophysitism, condemned initially, condemned at a council, but later accepted. Damn. So yeah, well, Lord willing, and we can do it Monday. And like I said, take your time. I don't want you to rush this because you see, when you take your time, people are understanding. And when they're understanding, that's when they're getting rocked. It's when they understand what you're saying, they're getting more confused. Because this uh, is a church history we were not told in the West. I wasn't told. In the West, we only hear about Eastern Orthodox and the Catholic and the controversies. Poor Oriental Orthodox are out there somewhere in their own world. And we do not know, right? We do not know the beliefs and why you believe what you believe and the evidence you have. I didn't know about this. When you told me St. Cyril was a Miaphysite, I thought you confused him with St. Cyril of Jerusalem. Let me give you just a real quick anecdote. The first time I heard someone affirming Miaphysitism in the early church was in the dialogue between Marmilis, the bishop of the Assyrian Church of the East, and a Coptic priest. It's online. The Coptic priest said to him, St. Cyril of Jerusalem affirmed one nature. And he quoted him. I go, hmm, that's interesting. Cyril of Jerusalem affirmed Miaphysitism. So when you guys mentioned St. Cyril, I thought you confused St. Cyril of Jerusalem with St. Cyril of Alexandria. That's why if you go back to part one, I asked, wait, are you talking about St. Cyril of Alexandria? You go, yeah. He also believed in Miaphysitism? Yeah. There you go. So now look at this guy says, St. Cyril of Alexandria wasn't a Miaphysite. What, what color is this guy in your world? They just spent two sessions quoting him. <laughs> What color I mean, is that even even a the formula? Like, what are you talking about? That's so what funny. color is the sky in your world? They just spent two sessions giving you the quotes. And even the Catholic, one Catholic admit, yeah, you didn't know that? There was a Catholic sister who told me, oh, you didn't know this? 
No, I didn't know that. Oh, okay. But any final remarks on your part? Because if you want, Les, do you have anything to add to anything? Because you didn't talk. Is there anything you want to say, or you're good? Les. Yeah, I just want to comment on like the office. I think so. Please. We believe that Saint Cyril uh, was the one who um, stressed out the formula, but mm. everyone before him, which we will be showing uh, hopefully next time, uh, believed in miaphysticism. Of course, they might not have maybe used the exact same words as Saint Cyril, but they all used a, uh, um, a language of oneness, which some used as mixture, blending, mingling, and so on. And so, God willing, we will be showing that next time. Let me Perfect. let me destroy this uh, blasphemy. No, actually, it backfires against you, evening doubt. Let me tell you how you just buried yourself. Okay. You said, so God made the cows of no victorious, but left the Orientals in the dust. Now, let me show you how you just buried yourself. Oh, let me, let me. The Oriental Orthodox were left on their own without any imperial power without any emperor backing them up, without any armies. They were left at the mercy to be slaughtered by Persians and Muslims and by imperial forces. And miraculously, they survived and they're not extinct. So against impossible odds, the Oriental Orthodox survived, even though they were slaughtered by Muslims, Zoroastrians, and by imperial forces. They survived with their theology and liturgy intact against impossible odds. You just argued that God preserved them against impossible odds, whereas everyone else had imperial power backing them up. So you just buried yourself, you filthy, wicked, Jezebel, son of a spiritual whore. See, I'm politically and, correct. And, and I want to comment on this. I want to comment on this. There's 60 million of us, just so you know. Yeah, we are nowhere near extinction. But I want to mention real quick, by this same logic, we should have all been Aryans. Arians were the majority at one point. Saint Athanasius is famous for saying, "I am against the world because the whole world was against yes. him." So yeah. should we? We should all be Arians by now. And during the era of Constantinople III for the Chalcedonians, once again, Maximus, their saint, he was like basically the only person in the world who believed in what he believed. No one sided with him. Again, during the iconoclast era, the empire was iconoclast, and they had no one. So. This is just such a terrible argument. And exactly. the fact the fact is, even throughout history, in the medieval ages, if you look at our numbers, we, and e as well as the Church of the East, actually, exactly. we, were, we, yes, we spent yes, over the entire East. We were probably more than the Eastern Orthodox at that time. The, biggest, it, church, the biggest church in the Middle East is what? Oriental Orthodox. <laughs> or, yeah. And, so that uh, applies to the Assyrian Church. By the way, Assyrian Church of the East, I'm not excluding you. You're part of the Church of the East. So you survived against impossible odds. Millions of Oriental Orthodox, Church of the East, slaughtered, <laughs> women raped, children enslaved, and they survived. Don't be ashamed. Be proud. That means the Lord, in his mercy, preserved you all in spite of the fact that someone has more of the fullness of the truth than the other. So I thank the Lord that when I go before the throne, this is my belief. The Lord's going to ask me, what did you think about the filioque? <laughs> what? And what did you think about the hypostatic union? And did you think it's a particular universal? Thank you, Lord. I won't have to pass a theological quiz. <laughs> I don't know what you think, but I think I pray the Lord doesn't grade me on perfect theology. Now, if he graded us on looks, all of you on the channel would be the first to be thrown in hell, and I'd be one of the first to enter heaven. <laughs> what do you guys don't agree with that? What are you trying to say? I'm ugly. So we any final we agree, we agree. Don't worry. By the way, uh, subdeacon, emphasis on sub. You're losing your hair. You're fighting a losing battle. Either go to Turkey and get hair transplant or shave it. Go bald, brother. You're fighting a losing battle. I'll consider the I'll consider the first option. Maybe I'll meet our friend over there. You know, who you got it. You when you go to Turkey, get me because I can't land in Turkey. So when I land in Turkey, my head will be one place and my body somewhere else. <laughs> So, brethren, if you want, let me know. We can do Monday again, same time. I'm open, Lord willing, unless something happens. But excellent session. And Shema Shazai, look, I love you, young man. I'm not giving our time because I want to condemn you. But I'm giving you pushback because one thing I've noticed, this is true of everyone. Once you're committed to a position, no amount of evidence will convince you otherwise. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit. I'm not condemning the Syrian church. I've never condemned the Syrian church. What I'm saying is Theodore's got to go, Assyrians. I'm sorry. I, he's got to go. He's got to go. He's got to go. 
I, I don't know how to say it. He's not the blessed interpreter any more than Arius was. But any final words from your part? And guys, Lord willing, in several hours, I'm going to do the finale on the bishop. I'll be back in about three, four hours, God willing, to do the finale. Final words from all of you, and we'll wrap it up. Thanks again, Sam. We appreciate you, buddy. Uh, next week, um, inshallah, we'll, we'll continue part three. Uh, we're excited to be here. And yeah. also, uh, we hear, you know, stuff like that from other people, not just from you, Sam, that, like, you're messing up, you know, what I thought about church history before that. And just know that God will give you grace if you cooperate yeah. in course. your study, as I'm sure all of you listening know that um, – yeah, you just you just have to pray about it, and you also have to study about it. It's it's a both and, and so yeah. just do that, and God will guide you into the true church. There's Amen. no question that God is merciful and providential to be able to do that for you, and so you just have to trust Him. Amen. I trust. Amen. That's my trust that the Holy Spirit will guide us in the fullness of the truth. You, the rest of you guys, if you have some final comments, go ahead, brethren. I guess that they don't want to say anything. All right. That's yeah, it. That's I guess we're done. I guess so. Yep. All right. Brethren, I love you for the sake of the Lord. And again, I want you to understand. The rest of you, though you disagree, be patient. I said he'll be in here in February and he's going to give his side of the story. And if I can get a Catholic, I'll do that. You understand? I do that. You'll have all the presentations archived. You can upload them and then you come to your own conclusion. My reactions are genuine because I am shocked to hear this. I didn't know there were so many people recognized as saints that affirmed miaphysitism. I thought it was always diaphysitism. Now I'm learning that no, history is not that clean cut. So Lord willing, I pray I continue to grow and honor the Lord, not offend, but not be politically correct. I'm not here to tickle anyone's ears because at the end of the day, I want you to remember this. This is real. We're not dealing with make-believe. We're not dealing with fantasy. Jesus is alive. Let me remind you of this. Jesus is almighty. He's real. He's living. He will come to judge the living and the dead, and he's going to start with his church. We will stand before Jesus and give an account. Take that to heart. May we believe that to the utmost of our being. Our Lord is alive, and we will stand before him. I want to stand before him with a clear conscience. Therefore, if you're holding to a position because you're afraid of peer pressure, you need to repent. Suffer attacks, insults, ridicule here so the Lord will exalt you there instead of denying the Lord for the praise of men and status and then have the Lord humiliate you on the day of judgment. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 10 to 11. We will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account for everything we've done in the body, whether good or bad. We will answer to the Lord. This is why I don't care what people think of me. I don't. Because when I'm standing before the Lord, it won't be a bishop or a deacon standing next to me. It will be my Lord and I, and I have to give an account for why I did what I did and believe what I believe. So if you are in a position and you're afraid to let go of that position because of peer pressure, may the Spirit convict you and haunt your conscience until you repent. You will answer to the Lord, not to man. Christ is risen, risen indeed. See you soon, Lord willing, in a couple hours. God bless you, man. Take care.